My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Are you expecting tonight? Wow. I hope that the heavens will open. <laughs> if somebody is hungry tonight. Hey. You know, I always have this crisis when I come to the north. If I find myself in the south. The last time I was in the south, while I was ministering, literal smoke was coming out of my body. And it stood on my head. I was roaring like a lion. But when I come to the north, maybe you people are too on fire. So God wants me to step it down and instruct them. But this night, we will break the protocol. <laughs> ah! We need the widest kind of people to rise from the north. The widest crazy hunters in the spirit that can move the hand of the heavens and walk into rooms of darkness and shatter it so that foundations that were built by sorcery and astrology can be destroyed and the light of God's glory rise and shine again. <laughs> the hope of power is in northern Nigeria. The hope of power. You see there is witchcraft in the east. But when you understand the powers of sorcery and astrology, then you understand that there, is, there are forces beyond the depths of the waters. There are men that walk from the heights of the heavens. Have you come out before in the night and you see somebody talking with the moon? Drag the moon from heaven down. And then on the strength of that conversation, it can choke the destiny of a whole generation. You don't know why men will pray and they can't ascend. Because somebody dragged the moon from heaven and it was he was, he was interacting with the moon. Those are the kind of powers that are in the north. It's farther than, witch, than witchcraft. We need wise men. Wise. Men that can abandon themselves for God. And tonight, the hand of God will come on somebody. Hey. Hey. God is raising something. God gave me a word for the sisters here. But if we are sent, that's when I will, I will speak. In the name of Jesus. Please celebrate the ministers of God in the house. And of course, everyone that is represented here, thank you for coming. The future of the body of Christ depends on you. Come on, give the Lord a big hand. And you lift your hands toward heaven as we begin to look upon the great monarch of Zion, even tonight, trusting that he will bring us insight. He will bring us wisdom and direction. The greatest gift of a generation is the gift of discernment. Not discernment of spirits, but the gift of sound judgment to be able to articulate the emphasis of God for that generation. Because the moment discernment is formed, it begins to modify your life. It begins to govern and to regulate the direction that you will go. It will change your priorities. A generation without discernment don't know what to do. And they don't understand the priorities of the kingdom. There are many things that are obtainable in the kingdom. But only by discernment can we know what God is doing part time. And deploy our lives accordingly. That's why the Bible said the sons of Isaac. He said they had understanding of the times and the seasons and knew what Israel ought. Not what Israel can do. What Israel ought to do. He said the heads of them were only 200. He said but all their brethren 
were their commander. They were the Levites and they were the priests that had the responsibility of studying the Torah and reading the Torah to the people of God so that they can understand the ways of the Spirit. But when it came to what God was doing in a generation, only the men of the Shaman had the capacity to enter into the heavens and tell us what God is doing by time. The Shaman is the greatest gift of a generation. The Pharisees were studying the books. They were masters of the Torah. They were reciters of the laws of Moses. But the prophecy that was hanging for 700 years was about to come to bear. But they could not discern that the time of the Messiah had come. They were still doing the priestly rituals in the, in the altar. They were running through the tabernacle. Meanwhile, the Messiah was in the world. And Jesus was in the world for 30 years. But the Pharisees could not discern because discernment was lacking in that generation. Only three men were able to travel into the spirit and they knew that no, what is going on now is not prosperity. What is going on now is not healing. What is going on now is not the ironic priesthood. What is going on now is the betting of a prophecy. The Messiah is walking by the borders of our land. And suddenly in the baptismal service, John looked upon him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. What we were laboring for for many hundred years. Behold, the Lamb of God. Our sins are about to be carried away by a lamb that came from heaven. But these guys were still slaughtering bulls. They were still killing cows. And they were still sprinkling the blood on the mercy seat. But a man of discernment stood and he said what? Behold, the lamb of God. You don't need to carry the bull's blood into the holy of holies anymore. Why? Behold, the lamb of God. If you don't have discernment, your life will be scattered. You may know the Bible, you may be an orator, but you may not be relevant in the kingdom. It was on the strength of discernment that John was able to depart from his family. And the Bible said he was in the wilderness until the day of his showing forth. That was not consistent with the priestly ritual. As the son of a priest at the age of 12, he was supposed to become a master of the Torah. At the age of 21, he was supposed to be ordained into the Levitical order of priesthood to function in the order of his father. But the man by discernment he knew that he was the boy of the one crying in the wilderness and such training that syllabus was not available in the order of the ironic priesthood so he left the ironic priesthood and he went into the wilderness if you saw john you will say this man is a fool he's a vagabond but something had happened to him discernment the reason you are still holding tight to your ambition and your proclivities is because you have not discerned maybe if the lord opens your eyes then you will discover that the mantle of deborah has been moving on your head since you were a child you don't know you are a Deborah. So you thought you are a beauty queen. And you are excelling in beauty pageant. Meanwhile, in the spirit, you are supposed to be a Deborah. That can cause the heavens to bow. Discernment. Discernment. Go ahead and ask the Lord to speak to your heart this evening. That your eyes may be open. Your priorities will change. Your way of life will change. Because the summit may tell you your story from Zion. Men may call you a vagabond, but when the summit comes, you will know the way. The reason your life is the way it is is because you are a prophet.
wana tila prade kumba na katali ato kabaya Rakade kita kuma na tanti ato tatole Your greatness is that the mercy of your descendants Your greatness is that the mercy of your descendants That you may see the spirit and understand the body of the heart Dictates and the writings of our ordination that they may be revealed to us on Zion. That the prophet may not end up a politician. That the brother may not end up a harlot. How come was Rehab a harlot? On the descendant cave. As the love of the Thank you, Father. Barabababoa. Ela matoria na tabas. Kataria tena taboa. Yadi tabas kubalata. Yada tabora kadienda sapoa. Yada tanas yada tanas. Rapapoa tatale kapapoa. Endo rahadizo do rakapadina kapoporiende ka. Amen. O suda dizo tatai. O bastatina a suduba a bole kasizoa. Without discernment is walking with a curse. Your greatness is at the mercy of your discernment. This is why Gideon, the deliverer of Israel, can be living in hiding and obscurity. Meanwhile, every investment of heaven was already upon his life. The angel never imparted him. He said, Go in this dynamite. Having all the power to deliver a nation, but the Bible said he was stressing the floor in the wine press. The guy went, he changed location so he could not be identified. It's just like going to pray in the library so that they don't know you are praying. That was the level of cowardice. But everything he needed to deliver the nation was already in him. There was no discernment. Now God may help us to realize the reason why a Deborah can be a bomb shot wearer and a nightclub dancer is the lack of discernment. The reason why a, a prophet can be laboring for a governorship ticket is lack of discernment. He thinks his value is in popularity among men. He doesn't know that by the right things of ordination, he is a popular being in the regions of the mortars. It is angels that should clap for him. But he is struggling for influence among men. A generation is dislocated when there is no discernment. This is why people run to do things because they think their security in those, is in those things. They have not found security in God. Sometimes it takes God a lifetime to alter our perspective. There must be a shift in paradigm. To understand what was written concerning you in the volumes of the books. The reason Jesus lived an accurate life is because he functioned by perfect discernment. Even the land where he lived, it was prophesied. I come to do thy will, O God. Mm. We need to be helped. Talking big things but without reality. A man who is supposed to deliver Kanu 
is running to survive in Lagos because he thinks life is in Lagos. He runs from Nigeria to London to take care of dead bodies and walk in the mortuary. A man who is supposed to be a national figure in Africa because he thinks life is beyond the borders of Africa. He runs to America and he's living on the streets. Whereas he's a light of a generation. That the Lord will help us to be furnished with sufficient discernment. Maybe the reason why you are where you are is because you've not discerned. When I was about turning 28, God came to me and He told me, if you don't enter Jerusalem by 28, your destiny will be lost. I was still hustling. Finished my master's degree, wanted to go for PhD. I was hustling because I thought it was about certificate. Meanwhile, the destiny of a prophet was dying. I didn't know that my life the totality of my body in this generation was in my voice. I thought it was in certificate. That the Lord will help us to understand. Discernment, discernment, discernment. Pray for one minute. Tell the Lord to open your eyes to see what was written concerning you before the foundations of the world. <laughs> it was written before the foundations of the world. There is light. There is, listen, listen to what's happening in the spirit. There is visible light. Touching people. Light. Opening their eyes in the spirit. Light. Light. Beyond what I'm about to teach. Light is coming from heaven. Listen. 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 Beyond what I want to share this evening. Something is happening in the spirit. There is an envelope of light that is coming upon this building. As we pray in the next 10 minutes, some of you, your eyes will open. You will know why you were born for the first time. It will remove pressure from your life. Come on, go ahead and pray the Holy Ghost. the most significant quadrant of the army you will raise is an army of women. The borders will rise from your camp. Women that will be prophets and psalmists entering into the land and shutting down darkness such that we amaze you a woman with a strength of hundred men. They will be feeble by looking upon them but in the days of fire you will see them burning with the flames of glory. You are about to bet something from the womb of the Spirit. In the next two minutes, as we play radically, something will gush out of you and it will determine the direction you will go in your life. Something is about to gush out. Lift your hands to heaven. There are sprinkling. In the name of Jesus. Listen. Listen. 
the ordinations have already begun. You know, God's servant said, don't wait until the end of the service when we start praying. Most of you, <laughs> coals of fire, coals of fire are about to be taught on your top. Coals of fire. People that can speak for God. Radicals in the kingdom. Men that are not afraid of death. Men that are not afraid of peril. Men that can have served their lives for the kingdom. Holy Spirit of God. I set them on fire. Set them on fire. Just lift your hands toward heaven and be quiet for a moment. There are some recipients of fire that are here this evening. Some of you, your body will begin to burn you literally as if you are standing close to flames. Some of you, your tongue will literally be set on fire now. Your tongue. You will be speaking in tongues now not because you want to speak in tongues but a flame will touch your tongue. Some of you, your legs will begin to burn. Different dimensions. Different manifestations of fire. Some of you will wear garments of fire. Some of you will wear gloves of fire. Some of you will be taught with coals of fire on your tongue. You are about to be changed. You've been too normal. You've been normal for too long. And so Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, let the fire begin to restore the symbol for me. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. We are those who are clothing with fire. Let the fire begin to rest. Let the fire begin to rest. Flames of fire. Flames of fire. Allow the angels to minister to them for two minutes so we don't get too emotional. Focus, don't speak in tongues until something is happening to your tongue. Don't be religious. Holy Spirit, let the fire rest on them and their lives be changed forever. 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 Holy Spirit. Touch their tongues now, Lord. Touch their tongues. Let their vocal cords be loosened. Lord, clothe them with garments. The ones you have ordained for this city. Clothe them with garments of fire. Oh my God. The spirit of fear is going out of you now. The spirit of fear. And it's replaced with the spirit of boldness. Boldness to declare the counsel of God. The powers of religion. The powers of human rituals. They are breaking off you now. Lord Jesus. We are the ones who have ordained for the city. 
Thank you, Holy Spirit. The fire we born in your heart on ending. A flame is kindled in your heart. A flame. A flame. Witnesses indeed will arise. Witnesses. Men that can choke the powers of Islam. Witnesses. Witnesses. True kingdom functionaries. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Most of you are sensing a heaviness on you. Don't bother. You will understand what's happening to you when the conference is over. Your life will never remain the same again. Thank you, Father. You may be seated. God bless you. share the word of God for at least one hour before we begin to pray God's servant came and casted some burdens and um, it's on the strength of that burden that we just stretch a bit in prayer when I'm done teaching God, we do what he, he wants to do in our midst tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ. Tonight, I want to build a bit more from what God began to bring our way yesterday as touching the subject of priesthood. When doctrine is not balanced, when the emphasis of God is not fully captured and articulated, even people that are genuinely interested in God and in serving His purpose can be misled. 
and they will think they are making so much progress but at the end of the day their lives may not count you are not big in the kingdom because you can receive from God you are not mighty in the kingdom because you have faith to receive from God you will truly become mighty in the kingdom when you can give to God and give for the kingdom this is the sharp contrast between the gospel of grace and the gospel of the kingdom the gospel of grace became necessary because of the fall of man the only way man could be reinstated back to his standing with God was in the provision of grace captured in the mercy of God and revealed by the finished works of Christ so on the strength of our apprehension of what God has freely given to us then we are restored back to the kingdom so the goal of God is not primarily to give us because before God created us everything we ever needed was available so the essence of faith was not primarily to receive from God because man had no need for anything when he was created everything man was ever in need of was available for him in the garden what then did God put man in the garden for he says to keep it and to guide it that is priesthood and kingship by priesthood man is supposed to connect earth to heaven so that the dimensions of heaven that the garden symbolize can advance to every part of the earth realm to the degree that earth will become a mirror image of heaven so the goal of God was to create a functionary on earth that will ensure that earth becomes a replica of heaven through priesthood interaction. And by authority of kingship, he will subdue everything in the earth that does not pay allegiance to Zion. That's why it says to him to dominate. The mandate of dominion. But before the mandate of dominion was ever given, the man was asked to what? To dress the garden and to keep it. So after you receive everything Jesus gives to you and you are restored back to where you fell from, then you go back to the original assignment, which is what? To dress the garden and to keep it. But unfortunately, many are in church and for 10 years, 15 years, all they are learning is how to receive from God. Go back for a moment and study the book of Hebrews chapter 11. And then when you see the heroes of faith, you will discover that not up to 10% of the people numbered there made it to that list because they received from God. The Bible said Enoch walked with God and was not. So what gave Enoch the credential of making it into that list was not his ability to receive anything from God. His name made an appearance in that list because he was able to depart from his generation an adulterous and corrupt generation and he banished himself to the degree that he was imprisoned in relationship with God. Enoch had the power to forsake the pleasures of that generation and he gave himself perpetually to walking with God. You may not know what it means to walk with God. <laughs> walking with God is not pleasure. It's actually, the word means to become a puppet in the hand of God. So Enoch was willing to become what? A puppet in the hand of God. That's when you can have an ambition. You got that money to build your house. And God comes and says, go and deposit that money to the orphanage in Kano. You will now understand that walking with God is not to sing a sweet song and then you lift your hand because you enjoy the melody. Walking with God means becoming a puppet in the hands of God. Where the will of God can be lived out through you. That was the life of Enoch. The Bible said Noah, when he was warned of God, of the evil to come, he moved with reverence. Another departure from the world.
the Bible spoke about Abraham that when God commanded him, he departed from his kingdom. Another departure from the world. It says Moses, when he was come of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than the pledges of Egypt, which is for a season. Another departure from the world. All having the capacity to receive from God but they understood that relevance in this kingdom is not the degree to which you can receive from God. It is the degree to which you can give to God, including your own life. A dimension that is no longer taught in the body of Christ. So we judge men by what they have. We don't judge men by what they give to the kingdom. In the days of the patriarchs, they never celebrated birthdays. That's why you don't know the birthday of any of the patriarchs. They only celebrated death days. They want to know how you left this world. Are you willing to spend and be spent for God? So the only date you will, remain, you will see when you go through church history is the days that these men died and the manner in which they died. And most of them died agonizing in pain so that the kingdom Makoba Rahasua you know, John was roaring in the wilderness. Prepare way for the Lord. Until Jesus came, he now said, I must decrease while he increased. <laughs> the line of inspiration I was moving on. I, I see, I've just, I've decreased. <laughs> I will just share the word of God when I'm done. God's lover will come and bless us. Hallelujah. Hey, this is amazing. No wonder God led me to do a brief impartation at the beginning. <laughs> when you are there, 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 in the name of Jesus. So, in the context of the kingdom, men do not become great because they have so much faith to receive from God. God judges the stature of men to the degree that they are willing to abandon themselves for him. The degree to which they are willing to spend and be spent for God is what determines their ranking in the spirit. So a quick glance in the hall of fame revealed to us that there were so many rich and mighty men that walked and traversed the face of the earth but they did not make it to the number when the hall of fame was, was written out and the ranking of men were identified. Most of the men that made it to the list, what God looked at in their lives had nothing to do with what they could acquire from God. It had everything to do with what they were willing to give to God. And most of them, in the days of their existence, they were not even relevant among men. But they understood the technology of the spirit to which they were willing to die so that they could become popular with the immortals because they understood that life had no value if it is judged only from the plane of the natural that is why Paul said if only in this life we have more hope we have hope we are of all men most misery so when God began to really reveal to us what made men relevant with him he began to show us the things that mattered in the heights of Zion and the first that God revealed to us was Abel he said Abel 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 what made Abel relevant was his offering to God he said, Abel gave a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. On the strength of his sacrifice, the Bible said Abel was able to open a possibility in the spirit that never existed. The possibility of immortality. Adam was supposed to be the first to touch the reality of immortality. And the only access point into immortality was for him, for him to eat of the tree of life. But Satan came and truncated the process. And Adam did not understand what it meant to walk in immortality. So the dimension of immortality was obliterated from the realm of human existence. But a man came into the world. And on the strength of his relationship with God, he understood that the way to immortality was not only the tree of life. He knew that if he was able to spend himself for God, there is an economy in the spirit that will bequeath him the protocol of immortality. So when God had a need, 
Abel gave the best of all that he had and what he gave became a testimony and the Bible said on the strength of what he gave even while he was dead his blood cried from the ground so Abel understood how to walk into the economy of immortality because he knew the intelligence of giving your all to God so men become ranking in this kingdom not on the strength of what they can receive but on the strength of what they can give to God so even as a man who had no breath on his nostrils, the blood of Abel had the stature to gather the courts of heaven. Because Abel was the first personality that revealed to us that it was possible to petition a man in the heights of the heaven. We did not know there were courts in Zion until the blood of Abel began to cry for the ground. And suddenly the Bible said, the judge of all appeared and he said, Cain, Cain, where is thy brother? Cain thought he was relating with God as usual. You know, you can come for fellowship and they say, let us pray. And you sit down, you are yawning. It's because it's only the Father you know. But God has many dimensions. There's a dimension of God that is a judge. If you only know the Father, when the judge show up, you may not be careful. So you may violate intelligent dynamics and protocols. And your violation of that protocol may cost you your life. So when he said, where is thy brother? Cain thought it was the way they talked to God normal. He said, am I my brother's keeper? And the, the judge began to talk. This time around, it was not Elohim. This time around, it was Jehovah Elohim. You know, these, these are two dimensions of the revelation of God. Elohim reveals the might of God in creation. Jehovah reveals the authority of God to demand justice from creation. There are two different dimensions. Both of them means almighty. But one of the dimensions of Almighty in Elohim reveals that God has the power to bring everything out of nothing. But Jehovah, which is also Almighty, revealed that God has the power to demand justice from the creation that he has made. That was why the first time God was revealed as Jehovah was after the man ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So he came to judge because creation belongs to him. If you know Elohim and you don't know Jehovah, you can say it's my mouth so I will say what I want to say. You can say it's my money so I will do what I want to do with it. But the day you begin to understand the revelation of God having authority to demand your life, even the money in your bank account, you will know you are a trust. So if he comes and he says, give, there will be no argument. You will know that this is your body. You will do everything to mortify it because even your body is not your own. So Cain did not understand that the one talking was the judge of all. He said, am I my brother's keeper? And he said, the voice, the blood of that brother is crying to me from the ground. And instantly, he began to release cause. Those were the conclusions and the verdicts that were passed in the court. Because this time around, a man of sufficient ranking has spoken in the courts of heaven. And on the strength of his utterance, the destiny of Cain was received from him. So stature in Zion, as revealed by the life of Abel, was a life of perpetual sacrifice. So Abel gave his all until tomorrow. That portal that the life of Abel revealed to us is the only access point that gives a man rank in Zion. The way of sacrifice. That was why even Jesus himself, when he came to this world, he had to obey that pathway that Abel created. He said, except the corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abided alone. And when he died, Mary wanted to touch him at the tomb. He said, no, I have not ascended to heaven. Because for you to be accepted, for your blood to have stature in the courts of heaven, your sacrifice must be what? Perfect. That pathway was created by Abel. That is why these guys are called patriarchs. They are not called patriarchs because they came first. They are called patriarchs because they pioneered dimensions in God. If it was about who came first, Adam would have been the first in Hebrews chapter 11, but Adam is not there. He didn't pioneer anyway. Abel pioneered the pathway of excellent sacrifice. And it was by excellent sacrifice that you and I are saved. If the blood of Jesus did not satisfy the claims of divine justice, you and I would have remained in our sin. The man that ascended to heaven and revealed to us that blood has utterance and the utterance of blood can bring a verdict from Zion to alter the balances in the earth realm was Abel. So Abel became the first human being that had stature in Zion. And Abel gained stature by what? By sacrifice. The crisis of the grace movement is that they are obliterating responsibility from our work with God. So you think you have stature because you say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You don't have understanding. 
Every time justification is revealed, sanctification must follow. Justification is what Jesus did for acceptance. Sanctification is what you will do to be accepted. Every time forgiveness is preached, obedience must follow. This is the complete package of the gospel. This is why there are many churches, but there is no effect in the territory because there are no ranking men. He said, When God spake, Noah moved by reverence. God spoke, and instantly a man abandoned a generation and he went for 100 years. Nobody knew the job Noah was doing, but fear compelled him to leave everything he had and he went. He built that ark for 100 years. His life was taken from him because what? The monarch of Zion uttered his voice and he picked it an instant. That's why I told you the greatest gift of a generation is discernment. The reason you can live your life the way you want is because you don't have discernment. The moment by discernment John realized that according to the writings of ordination, he was the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. He abandoned the order of the priesthood. He went to live in the wilderness. You can afford to live for your job and your office because you have not discerned. If God were able to open your eyes and you realize that you are a Deborah in this generation, prayer will become your first occupation. So what gave Noah rank was his fear for God. And his fear for God became an opening for him to commit himself to the Lord. And Noah opened a new order that we don't understand until his time. Noah was the one that revealed to us the protocol of acceptable service. Nothing you do in the kingdom will be accepted by God unless it is done with what? With reverence. It was Noah that pioneered it. It's a way of life that is not obtainable among mortal men. Even God, when he looks at these people, he, he, he marvels. How did they understand how to please the spirit? Because the ways of spirit on account of the poor became distant from the ways of men as the heavens are far above the earth. By what system of intelligence do these men suddenly begin to understand how spirit entities work? See, tomorrow, no service will be accepted in Zion unless it is done with what? Reverence. You know, now we serve God with skill and gift. So when you say pray, the guy that has the capacity for prayer, he just sits down. Then you call him, then he walks like this. And then he carries the microphone. He's, he wants to reveal his talent. Or you say, let's worship God. And instantly, Sister Mercy, because she has the best voice. You think it's about melody. Have you heard one angel sing? If it is about melody, the whole human race cannot make the choir of heaven. They have instruments that men have not yet discovered. Apostle told us the first time he went to heaven, he saw a harp that had 19 strings. The biggest guitar we have here is six strings. There are sounds that are not yet on earth. There are certain sounds that communicate judgment. There are certain sounds that communicate blessings. So when God is speaking from Zion, it is sound that communicates it. There are certain sounds that earth does not have the permission to hear it yet. Because if it is heard, a dimension will break out of heaven to the earth realm. So if it's about melody, see, none of us matches, none of us makes it to the choir. Service in the kingdom, Noah revealed that it was an act of the fear of the Lord. So in Hebrews chapter, chapter 12 verse 28, the Bible said what? That having received a kingdom that cannot be moved, let us receive grace to serve God acceptably with fear and reverence for our God is a consuming fire. So the only way that your service can pass through the fires of eternity and be relevant in Zion it is when it is done with what? With fear and trembling. Not when it is done with skill and dexterity. It was Noah that pioneered that dimension. And the only way Noah was able to enter into that level of wisdom in Zion was because he departed from the world. So stature in the kingdom is not your ability to receive from God. Your ability to receive from God is babyhood level of faith. If you read the story of the prodigal son, you will understand. The younger brother that had no understanding of kingdom and government 
he came he said give me all i have he had faith in the love of his father so he made demand on all that he had and the father had no choice but to give him he went and squandered it and he still came back to his father if you have collected all you have which other space do you have so the faith to receive is babyhood faith that's why you see some people they go to sin they still come back and move in the anointing yes god is full of mercy and love so the moment you come you say i'm sorry and you lift your hand and you make a demand god will still answer but what you don't know is that you have no credit in eternity by the time we join into eternity you will have no credit and i don't have time to talk about the doctrine of eschatology i will have shown you how that even after hair and all that died in sin were joy there is still a place called outer darkness When you are there, when you are there, when you are there, when you are there. See, I'm taking time to establish this background because I want to show you how to be relevant in this kingdom. You can go and pray for a cripple. The cripple rise and you say, now I have rank. <laughs> the reason you will know you have no rank is that any time God wants to do something on earth, you will not be aware. Did you read the Bible say John did no miracles but Jesus came and he said of all men born of a woman there is none greater than John. So miracle is not a gateway to stature in Zion. As important as it is when God comes to check men out he will not count the things you received. He will not count it. Go and read Hebrews chapter 11. Take time and study it. You will be shocked. The only thing that somebody received that was numbered there was Sarah's faith to receive Isaac. And Isaac did not belong to Sarah. Isaac was a symbol of the blessing. Before we talk priesthood, we need to establish certain foundations. When they teach you about Abraham, they will tell you how that Abraham was blessed in gold, in cattle in silver and in all things how that the Lord blessed him in all things but they will not tell you how many years it took Abraham to be able to depart from his country his kindred and his family meanwhile when God came he never calculated the things Abraham had when God judged Abraham in Zion God judged Abraham by his ability to give away his son it was Abraham's obedience that gave him rank in Zion not what he has. But when they teach us about Abraham, they only teach us the faith to receive gold and silver. But if you check from heaven, Abraham's life was not calculated based on gold and silver. The Bible said he obeyed God and gave up Isaac in a figure. So it was Abraham's ability to give that gave him relevance in Zion. But the only faith they teach us is to receive. That's why there is no witness in our borders. If you go to cities like Lagos, Abuja, Port Harcourt, in the street you can see 30 churches. All of a sudden, nobody has revelation to go to Medugri anymore. Because Medugri is no longer part of where God is doing his kingdom. <laughs> all of a sudden, all the visions of God now stop in Abuja. You can't cross to Kaduna, Kano, Medugri, Gombe. No, no vision there anymore. That place has become Hades. So there is no need. All of a sudden, nobody is called to Afghanistan anymore. We are all called to America and to London. Because we don't understand the things that make men important. Every time we teach prosperity, we now look at material things. When we try, we look at bodily healing. Nobody is talking about the prosperity of the soul anymore. Because if you talk about the prosperity of the soul, you will discover that a church of 100,000 may not have up to 100 members. This is why we began to look at the subject of priesthood. Moses was in Egypt for 40 years. And I was amazed when I was reading the life of Moses. The scribes that were writing his story had nothing to write. The only things written about Moses was the saga that took place 
the long chain story and hustling that took place when he was a child nothing was written about Moses for 40 years until the Bible said when he was come of age when Moses decided to now give his life to God then the story was unending what happened to Moses between the age of 1 to 40 it was not in Zion every time you live your life for what you can receive from God the angels that are writing your story they have nothing to write so you go to heaven and they will check they will say did you live on earth which period did you leave? <laughs> this is why we, we need to teach. And we were able to talk to the point of sonship. And I told you that if God wants to begin with a man, of course the Bible says for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So all of us have become slaves of sin. We have no place with God anymore. So the first level of relationship is actually a place of no relationship. When you are a sinner and a slave of sin. That is when Jesus extends the hand of fellowship and brings you into the kingdom. So when God saves a man and brings him into the kingdom, he becomes a disciple. God begins to teach him the ways of the kingdom. Because probably he was educated by the world system. Most of us, we were not saved from our mother's womb. Before we meet or we read, Jesus reached out to us. We had received different form of teaching and dealing. Some of us were used to different things, you know. Like I was telling us yesterday, there are people now that you tell them that you are living a holy life. They say, "Who is holy in this world? Nobody is holy. Nobody." They think it's impossible to live a holy life because sin and iniquity have taught them how enslaved humankind is. That they think it's impossible now to draw strength from Zion and live like Jesus on earth. If you tell some people that you are living in divine health, they'll say, mm -hmm. so what happened to malaria? <laughs> you mean there are no mosquitoes where you are living? It is where you are living, not where I'm living. Because where we are living is actually a location in the spirit. Hope you know that when, I, when, when Elijah came to the king, he had no consciousness of the palace. He said, before God, whom I stand. So everything he speaks, he is speaking from heaven, not the reality of the palace. So the palace can't touch him. Before God, whom I what? Stand. Meanwhile, Adam was still in the garden. But God came and he said, Adam, where are you? So even though he was in the garden, the reality of the garden is far from him because he has lost his standing in the spirit. But here is another man who is in a corrupt world. But he said what? Before God, whom I stand. So the world can't touch him. He's an ambassador in this realm. But there is a way to travel there. You don't confess your way there, brother. <laughs> That's what they taught us in grace. I am the righteousness of Christ. And then the guy is living in iniquity. You know, the law is the lowest level of God's standard. When Moses interpreted the law, he said, if you sleep with a woman, it's immorality. Say, don't convert your, your brother's wife. Don't commit adultery. Jesus said, if you look at somebody lustfully, you're already guilty. So they didn't even interpret the law well. The law is the lowest standard of God. It is in grace that we see the highest standard of God. So the guy is confessing I'm the righteousness of Christ of I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, but his thoughts are choked with immorality. He is living in fear and is a captor in the hands of the devil. He doesn't know how to come out. So outwardly he lives a beautiful and excellent life, but his soul is damaged. This is why God of necessity must disciple men. And everybody must be discipled by the Holy Ghost. It is the Holy Ghost that knows the level of the damage of the fall in your soul. Every one of us will be taught doctrine. But we must all have our own unique consecrations. Your consecration is the heaviest molecule of your discipleship. Doctrine is, is, is cast on iron. You can't change it. And every one of us must be taught doctrine so that we understand the boundary of the provisions of God. But consecration is what will bring you into the experience of the Christ. And the Holy Ghost is the one 
that is the custodian of the syllabus of consecration. So when God saves you from the world, He brings you into a lexicon of discipleship. And He begins to show you the things that you must do in order to defy the effect of the fall in your soul. This is why I can't tell you what God is doing with me. Because it may be different from you. Maybe my own case, when I fell, or the impact of the fall on me, is that I'm weak towards women. Your own case may be that you are weak in your tongue. When the Holy Ghost is putting laws over my soul, the laws the Holy Ghost will put over my soul will be such that we choke the powers of lust in my soul. Your own laws will choke the power of lying in your tongue. So the Holy Ghost may come to you and say, every day don't talk until you have prayed in tongues for four hours. That's not a doctrine for me. And the Holy Ghost may come and tell me, don't have any female friend until you are 30. It will be an error for me to impose my own concentration on you because the effect of the fall in my life is different from your own. All of us, we know the doctrine of righteousness. All of us, we confess righteousness. But for me to become like Christ, I will not have a female friend until I'm what? 30. For you to become like Christ, you must not talk until you have spoken in tongues for four hours. This is what the grace preacher has, does not understand. That's why we are all confessing, but we have no experience. Because we have exonerated the Holy Ghost from the syllabus of discipleship. He said, I have many things to tell you. That's doctrine. How be it you can't receive it until the spirit of truth is come. He will guide you into all reality. So we said, for a man to grow in this kingdom, he must be exposed to the government of the Holy Spirit. I was sharing with them this morning, in Pastor Steve's church. And I told them, even the anointing, we don't understand the anointing. We don't understand that the anointing is not first of all for manifestation. The anointing is first of all for government. This is why nobody is truly anointed unless it's consecrated. Consecration is the foundation of the anointing. Everybody that loses his concentration, his anointing is corrupt. Because the anointing is first of all for government. In Psalm 110 verse 1 to 3, the Bible said concerning Jesus, it said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit down at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. And he said, The rod of thy strength shall depart out of Zion. That is the Holy Spirit. So the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in a man's life is dependent on the degree of his revelation of the Lordship of Christ. So the anointing functions to the degree of your alignment with the throne of the Christos. A man who is not under the government of the Holy Spirit cannot flow effectively under the anointing. So Jesus said, out of their bellies, in John chapter 7 verse 28, 38, 7 and 38, out of their bellies shall flow what? Rivers of living water. He said, but he was speaking of the Holy Ghost who have not yet been given because Christ have not yet been glorified. So if you are accurate with the anointing, you must be under the government of Jesus. This is why we are flowing in the anointing, but there is no power of transformation. The church where you see cripples rising, the church where you see somebody calling names and phone number, if you shift to the side and you hear the workers talk, you will begin to cry. I've been to many. You come, the prophetic is moving. You are like Jesus, Jesus Christ. And then maybe you just stepped out to collect something. And then while the prophet is still ministering, two workers are toasting themselves. You know, I've been here for long. We pursued a lot of things so before God began to help us. If I tell you the anointed men that laid hands, that have laid hands on me, you will be shocked. We pursue, see, we pursue, and this is not a bit to despise the fathers, but this is why we understand that God is moving forward. Hope you know in Israel, they had no need for anything special. Their prosperity was tied to the degree of their serving the Lord. They had no need for evangelism. They were a tribe traveling together. If you were sick, just go to the priest, you'll be cleansed. But even in that context, where they were not doing evangelism, they were not doing miracle crusades, they were not doing teachings on prosperity, even in that context, God was moving. So when we talk about the move of God, it's not a bit to despise what God was doing. But there is something God wants to do in order to bring the soul under government. Because every time the devil attacks, is to ensnare the soul of a man. 
So God creates a syllabus of discipleship. And we said that syllabus was well captured in Romans chapter 12 from verse 1 to 3. Paul gave a narrative from Romans chapter 1 to Romans chapter 11. From Romans chapter 1 to Romans chapter 8, Paul revealed what Jesus did to redeem the Gentiles. From Romans chapter 9 to Romans chapter 11, Paul revealed what Jesus did to save the Jews. And then when he came to Romans chapter 12, he said, I beseech you, therefore. Therefore means what I'm about to tell you now is predicated upon what I've told you before. Therefore, I beseech you to present your bodies. This time you want to enter into experience. So you must have to what? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. So discipleship is not doctrine. Discipleship is the art of becoming what? A living sacrifice. Because the goal of discipleship is not to know about God. The goal of discipleship is to become like God. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God. Hope you know that the same Paul taught them prior to that time in Romans that they were already accepted in the beloved. Why will you now have to receive acceptance by submitting yourself as a living sacrifice? Because there are two dimensions in this business. For you to come into experience, you must accept what Jesus has done and on the strength of what Jesus has done, you must present your own self. He said, then you will be able to know what is the will of the Father. The perfect will, the good will and the acceptable will. He said, and you can prove. So the ability to demonstrate is predicated upon your coming under the government of the Holy Spirit. This is where many are lacking. And this is why we are doing everything the fathers did, but we have different results. We are fasting, we are praying, we are giving, but we don't understand the government of the Holy Spirit. When the fathers gather together in their own days, one of them, his consecration may be to pray all night. And he will be shocked that he has been praying all night for five years, for ten years, for fifteen years. One of them, his consecration may be to give 90% of everything that ever comes to his hand. And you'll be sure he will tell you that he has done that thing for 30 years. So when they come together to pray, their utterance is a witness on earth. But we are a people without consecration and we gather together to speak in tongues and we even deceive ourselves by calling it capital letter tongues. The fathers didn't know anything about capital letter tongues. They didn't even know anything about atmosphere. All they needed to do was to go to the market. They see a cripple. They say, stand up in the name of Jesus. We will have atmospheres and we have capital letter tongues. But we are the weakest in the generations of God. Because we have no consecration. And that is because discipleship is lacking. Discipleship has now become a function of seminaries and Bible schools. So we go to Bible school. We gather doctrine in our head. But there is no life in our spirit. Say, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God. I've been to the cities where generals of the faith are. And sometimes God says, keep quiet. Talk to them about yieldedness. Talk to them about transformation. And I will calm, da calm down. And when I finish teaching, I will feel so disappointed. Because I was not allowed to move in power. I wanted to shine like the sun. I wanted to mix words like a dangerous orator. But God said, calm down. Speak to them in plain terms about transformation. And then I will talk and go away crying. That her, I've disappointed these people. Ah, well, why didn't I? And then, after three days, more than 40 people will chat me. All of them have problem of masturbation. And I understood that it is possible to live with Jesus and be Judas. When you are there, when you are there, when you are there, when you are dead, when you are dead, when you are dead, when you are dead. You know why I'm sharing this thing with you? So you will know your level of relationship with God. And you will not deceive yourself and go and do something that will kill you. I know a lot of young people that violate the protocol of relationship. And because they saw somebody spoke to a madman and he was cleansed, they, they want to go to the shrine. They think it's about competition. They think it's about fame. So they go to a place and do what others do in the name of Jesus. 
and they come back crippled. And then you start wondering, no, there's power in the name of Jesus. Yes. But what you have is dependent on the level of what? Relationship. Jesus said something. He said, you are no longer servants but friends. Therefore, you have the right to know the secrets of the kingdom. Those guys have been with him for more than three years. They have completed the protocol of discipleship. Now they are his friends. You may be a servant and you want to do what friends do. You will be in trouble. All of them knew Jesus. All of them were with Jesus. But some are what? Are his friends. Others are his what? Disciples. When you are a disciple, God is still chiseling you because the negative effect of your soul will become what will empower a principality against you. Because principalities, the powers of principalities is in the laws of the spirit realm. When a prince comes to you, the first thing he will want you to do is to violate the law of the spirit realm. So the devil comes to you, he will never, he will never, because he knows the game of authority. He was an anointed personality in heaven. His problem had never been about the anointing. The Bible spoke about Lucifer. He called him the son of the morning. Lucifer was a reflector of the greatest dimensions of glory. In fact, when you looked upon him, he was brighter than the sun. The Bible said, from the day of thy creation, thy types and thy tablets were in thee. So he was the one that created the balance of sound in Zion. And remember, everything in Zion is calibrated with light and sound. If you have been to the spirit, you understand what I'm talking about. There's nothing in the spirit realm that works outside of light and sound. Satan was the balance of sound. And he was also a bright angel that was called the son of the morning. So, of the morning. So, he had a stake with light. So, in heaven, before the creation of humankind, Satan had so much authority and rank in heaven that he could determine the scope, the dimensions, and the delicate balance of Zion. Because he was the bearer of light and he was also the keeper of sound. His problem was never anointing. The Bible called him the anointed cherub that covered it. He was the only angel that the Bible ever mentioned that was anointed. That means he has a measure of God rubbed off on him. Remember, all the other angels have the name of God in their name. Michael, Gabriel. Satan didn't need the name of God. He was anointed. God was smeared on Satan. So his own insurance was in him. The insurance of God in the life of other angels was in their names. So Michael needed L. Gabriel needed L. Lucifer didn't need L. Because he was what? Anointed. The Bible said he was the one that covered it. That is the job description of the cherubims. The cherubims are the ones that keep and preserve the glory of God. They watch the jealousy of God. And they are the keepers of everything that has to do with the nature and the essence of God. Every time the glory of God is challenged, the cherubims move. Satan was a cherubim. Lucifer was a cherubim. The Bible said you move in the midst of the coals of fire. You were in Eden from the day of your creation. That means he had a stake among the seraphims. Because the seraphims are the ones that move to and fro in the coals of fire. But he understood the game of authority. So even though it seemed as if he was the most anointed of the angelic realm, he was fighting and bargaining for what? A throne in Zion. He knew the game of authority more than everybody. When he fell and he came to this world, when he went to Adam, he didn't go to fight him. He went for what? His authority. And the devil knows the only way you can lose authority is when you violate the laws of the spiritual. Remember, we don't fight demons by power. We fight them by authority. That is why you can be born again today and you can cast out a demon. Because you cast out demons in the name of Jesus. That's power of Anthony. But authority works to you to the degree that you don't violate the laws of the spiritual. The moment a man begins to violate the laws of the spiritual, the balance of authority is altered. That's why the name of Jesus means different things on different tongues. Not because the stature of the name reduces. It is the degree of your keeping the laws that govern the spirit realm. So I can call the name of Jesus here, nothing will happen. But if Reverend Bruno calls the name of Jesus, demons will begin to cry. 
It's not because the name had changed in stature. It is the degree to which I keep the laws of the spiritual. So when a demon, a, a prince in darkness comes to you, he will not fight you. He will first of all lure you to go and fornicate. The moment you fornicate, he doesn't need to fight you anymore. Because a law will make you a servant. Because whoever you yield yourself servant to obey, the servant of him you are, whom you have obeyed. Now, people who have not committed themselves to the protocol of discipleship, to be taught how to walk and keep the laws of the spirit realm, they want to go and do warfare in the heavenlies. Because they think it's about competition. If Steve can do it, I can do it. He sent his word to Jacob, a lighting upon Israel. This is why most of us, our lives have become a contradiction. So before God allows you to ever participate in priesthood, He will carry you through the line of discipleship. And discipleship is to kill the flesh so that God can be revealed in His full scope in the life of a man. When that happens, you become a friend of God. That's when you may come for a meeting. The standard procedure is to pray in tongues and then the atmosphere is charged and then you say, Holy Ghost, move. But when a friend of God shows up, <laughs> he can manipulate the protocol because he has access to the secrets of heaven. It is when you go through the path of discipleship and you become a friend of God, that is when you can walk in the experience of sonship. I told you yesterday, Galatians 4 1 said, The heir, so long as he's a servant, differeth nothing from a servant, even though he be what? Lord of all. So the argument is not that you are, the argument is not that you are not the righteousness of God. The argument is not that you are not an apostle. The argument is not that you are not a prophet. The question is, are you a child? If you have not journeyed through discipleship, you are a child. You can be in a church where they are looking for young men because hands are lacking, so they ordain you a reverend. That doesn't give you rank in Zion. The heir, so long as he's what? A child. Different nothing from a servant. Even though he be lord of all. So he said, therefore the father places him under what? Tutors and governors. Until the time appointed. On these matters, God will not change the standard. Because it's a game of spirits. God may allow you and you think you have grown. And then you go to a shrine. And what you'll be hearing is SOS. Save our soul. Because they will carry you on which year. And for 30 years you will be crippled. Because God. <laughs> when you are there. 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 You see the word used for a child. There is the word nephews. The guy was born of God. There is no argument. The guy is the righteousness of God. No argument. He has Jesus. No argument. But what? He's a nephews. He lacks understanding. He thinks serving God is about people falling down. He doesn't know that what God is interested in is to raise a generation that can bear his witness and carry his name as a signature so that everywhere they go, the dominion of Zion will stand like a bright light. So when he came for the meeting, all he's doing is, ha ha Meanwhile, the Holy Ghost is saying, talk to them about love. Because what this congregation lacks is different from what the congregation in Lagos lacks. You were in Lagos yesterday, everybody was under the power. Here, power is not the crisis. The crisis here is that they have lost their first law. So talk about the first law. When John went to heaven and he came back, the message for the seven churches were different. So the church in Laodicea may be lacking one thing. You won't carry the same thing to the church in Ephesus. So when a, when a man begins to grow, he knows what people need part time. He is no longer under duress. Some people come for meeting, you invite them, they only come and worship God and go back. Keep your honorarium. They are not doing what they are doing because of honorarium. But that man must have first of all been schooled in the spirit. When you complete discipleship and you become a friend, then God places upon you the authority of his son. And I told you sonship in the spirit is a bit different from in the natural Yes, as a son, you have the right to the kingdom. You are an heir of the kingdom. But what makes a son relevant in the kingdom is the level of responsibility he takes. 
Because God is looking for men that he can commit the burden in his heart to them. The Bible said, Who has believed our report? Unto whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? That is the recruitment phase when Jesus came. The guy that believes the report is saved. He becomes a citizen of Zion. He becomes an heir of the promises of God. He can say that promise all his life, but he will not be mighty. Until verse 8, he says, Who shall declare his generation? That's his son. He knows what the body in the heart of the father is. And on the strength of that, he is willing to give up anything that he can give up in order to do the will of the father. That's why I began by giving an illustration of men like John. He was the son of a priest. He had no business walking in lack. But the Bible said he was in the wilderness. Feeding on locusts and white honey. And his garment was camel skin. All his life until the day of his showing forth. Because he knew that what Zion needed at that time was a voice that can cry. Others were living in, in luxury and in plenty. So they had statutory positions and political positions. Even the office of the high priest was maligned. They had a political high priest. They had a religious high priest. But there was no voice. Meanwhile, in the kingdom of darkness, they knew that what God needed at that time was a prophet. So for 400 years, Israel was in darkness. There was no prophet. But there were no men to discern that there was a manipulation from Hades until John was willing to take the pride of separating himself. And when he was in the wilderness, the Holy Ghost began to teach him. And John will come back. They say, who are you? He went into the wilderness as John. But he came out of the wilderness as the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Who are you? I am. He journeyed in the spirit until a prophecy of 700 years. He now discovered that he was the one. How do you locate yourself in a prophecy of 700 years? Because when Isaiah prophesied, it was 700 years before Jesus came. How can you trace in the spirit until you identify an utterance 700 years before you came? You must be discipled by a spirit to do that. This is why all of us are saying we are the righteousness of God. But there are no men that we stand as lampstands in territory. So our territories are in darkness. Meanwhile, Jesus came. And Jesus went. Follow the Holy Ghost's dealing. The Bible said he was led to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. That was discipleship. When the Holy Ghost finished with him, the Bible said he went out. First, Luke chapter 4 verse 14. He said his fame went abroad. The man had not started preaching. How did his fame go abroad? Matthew 4 16. He said he went to this. The, 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 the size of Sidon by the borders of Zebulun that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet the land of Zebulun the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea beyond Jordan Galilee of the Gentiles the people that sat in darkness have seen the man enter the territory and suddenly darkness gave way how is that possible? Because he knows what it takes to be light. So he doesn't need to come and stand and say, I am the Messiah. See, a point came, they were, the people were tired. They say, if you are the Christ, tell us. He will not tell them. Meanwhile, what was generating from him was making effect in the borders of darkness. Every demon saw him and fled. Why have you come before your time? But men could not discern. So Jesus knew that this game is a game of spirit. That's why we do our show on the altar. When you carry the mic, <laughs> Meanwhile, the principality in Kanu, no, not Kanu, the one in Sabon he doesn't recognize you. The sons of Skipper came like this, came like this. He said, Kai, Paul, I know, Jesus, I know, who are you? I know you are calling the name of Jesus, but who are you? Who? We didn't see you in our lexicon. You are a non entity. Meanwhile, oh, 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 oh. people know psychology now, so you know what to do to get people to fall down. Oh, 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 oh. They pres uh, who is this one? Meanwhile, they are hailing you as opposed to A, the woman of fire. But the prince is in darkness, doesn't know you. Meanwhile, Jesus' case, every demon in hell knew that he had shown up. So Jesus could walk past your territory. He doesn't say anything. The principalities will vacate. Because the one coming is a high tension wire. 
if you allow him to talk, there will be crisis for seven years. So they try to avoid him so that he doesn't talk. Because if he talks, he can cast them to the abyss. When one saw him, he began to beg. He said, please cast us into the swine. Please, we can manage the swine. If he talks, you are in trouble. So Jesus can walk through a city, he will not preach. But darkness will roll away. This is the things the fathers knew. So some of them were in discipleship for 15 years before they preached their first gospel. Kenneth Hagin, that pioneered the move of the faith that we are all quoting now, he said he read the New Testament 150 times. And there were chapters he recited more before he preached the first gospel. Discipleship is not a function of Bible school. Bible school has a role to play, but discipleship is the dealing of a spirit over your soul. When you become a son, indeed, then you take responsibilities. And there are two kinds of responsibilities in this kingdom. The first kind of responsibility is what we call priesthood. The second responsibility is called kingship. So the burden in the heart of the father was not just to raise sons. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 4 to verse 6, he said, See the mighty work that I have wrought in Egypt. I carried you on eagles' wings by a strong hand. I took you out of Egypt that I may make of you a kingdom of what? Of priests and kings. So Peter came in 1 Peter 2 9. He said, You are a chosen generation, a holy nation, God's own special people. Call forth out of darkness to show forth his marvelous light. And the Bible will tell us in Revelation chapter 1 verse 6, Unto him that washed us and cleansed us and made us what? Priests and kings unto God. So a son in this kingdom has two designations. One is a priest. Another is a king. A priest is a legislator of the policies of heaven. A priest is a litigator of darkness. That is why I told you rank in this kingdom is not a function of what you can receive. It's a function of what you can give. When you become a son, your priority is no longer about asking. Hope you know the prodigal son is very intelligent in asking. But the elder brother never asked. The first time he was provoked, he said, you didn't even give me a lamb to slay with my friend. And the father said, ah, all that I have is yours. So when you become a son, your body is no longer about asking. Most of the things people pray for. Honestly, go and ask people that are grown in this kingdom. They will tell you they don't remember the last time they prayed for a need. I'm telling you, if you have begun to grow, you will be shocked that even when you have a need, you now ginger that you are going to pray, this thing will happen. If you go to the place of prayer, you will forget your need. Because every time you look to heaven, the heart of the Father is downloaded. You have become a keeper of the body in the heart of the Father. You have become a custodian of the heritages of God. And for you, legislation and litigation is the only object of your prayer. Every time you come to pray, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth. Thy kingdom. See, that thing will be so loud that you may not remember to pray for your need. If God wants to help you, you may send a prophet to prophesy. You will forget because bodies, bodies, only vexation. You will be see. Elohim, we worship you. Most Kadosh, Kadosh, Elohim. Kadosh, Kadosh Elohim You can't understand why John will be banished from civilization. The Bible said he was cast to the isle of Patmos. Why will he not pray for salvation? The guy will say, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. You are banished. They chased you out of civilization. All you know is pain. Why will you not pray for God to show mercy? Even in Patmos, he said, I was in the spirit. On the Lord's day, I heard a sound as of a trumpet. The guy was still doing the business of legislation. As far as he was concerned, his joy 
anchored on him seeing the will of God being done. This is why in the whole generation, only three people were relevant in the days of John. John, Enos, and Simeon. All of them were people who were legislators in the spirit. John, his own case was to see the Messiah show up. The Bible spoke about Enos. After she lost her husband, she was in the temple fasting and praying for 24 years. What do you mean? Is it wrong for women to get married? There is nothing wrong with it. But consecration is different from doctrine. She knew that the Messiah was about to come. There is a quorum on earth. There is a prayer energy that must rise from earth to be able to host that dimension of Zion. I told you yesterday that the Bible said in Revelation chapter 5 verse 8, it said the prayers of the saints, it ascend to Zion as others and they are stored up in golden vials. It is those prayers that God spends from to see that his purpose on earth comes to pass. Only men of understanding that know the weight of priesthood can sacrifice to ensure that there is enough prayer in the data bank of heaven. So that whatever God wants to do, there will be stature, there will be legitimacy, there will be rank on earth that can host those dimensions. So the woman gave up her life to prayer and fasting. Simeon, a man of prayer. When they brought Jesus, the guy was not aware. He was still praying. And suddenly the Bible says, Simeon went into the temple by the Spirit. The guy came to a point where even his steps were ordered. He was praying somewhere, but the hour has come. God had promised him that he will not see death until he saw the salvation of Israel. So that was his assignment. When Jesus said, if the Father come, will he find you doing the business? This is what he's talking about. When Jesus came, the guy was on his knees. And he said, Simeon, Simeon. He went to the temple by the Holy Ghost. And when he showed up, there were many child dedication going on. He went straight to the Messiah. He carried the little boy. How do you identify the infant Jesus? That guy had no name. He had not yet been named, but he knew him from Zion. By prayer, by peace, he had seen the figure in Zion. So even if Jesus is among 1,000 children, the guy knows him from Zion. Why do you think, how do you think Daniel will come into the temple? And they say there is a strange writing on the wall. No astrologer can decipher it. What is this? And the guy said, oh. Before he began to talk, he began to throw the king the legislations that were going on in the courts of heaven. He said, your father was blessed of God. God helped him to raise an empire and you succeeded your father. But you decided to abandon God and to worship the God of stone and iron. He said, therefore is this finger called. That finger is not a writing among men. It's a hand that came from Zion. It's a language of heaven. Only men that travel to heaven can decipher. He said, mene, mene. Take care of us. He said, your kingdom has been divided. Your kingdom has been given to the medics and the patients. Tonight you are judged. How do men become so mighty? They know the ways of priesthood. By prayer, they can enforce the, the purpose of Zion. That's why you can be in Kano. God is moving a lot, not aware. They are doing ministry. They are busy. Here and there. But they don't know the alarms of Zion. But when God wants to help a generation, He raises men. That's where the kings come. They know the mind of God. They want to enforce it. He said, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm upon my holy mountain. Because if men don't rise, if the purpose of God, if men don't rise, the purpose of God will die. The purpose of God only thrives on the altar of prayer. When you look at the whole civilization of humankind, every time God visited the earth, there was an altar burning. The Bible said, after that Cain slew Abel, he departed from Eden and he went to the east side of Eden and he established a city called Nord. It was in Nord that every civilization of darkness was born. But suddenly, the Bible said in Genesis 4.25 that God remembered Eden, Adam, and he gave him a seed after Abel that Cain slew. And he said, Abel, and he said his name was Seth. And he said, Seth gave birth to a child and he called him Enos. And he said, then, did men begin to call upon the name of the Lord? That was where the power of the city that came built was crumbled. Because what? Men 
began. That's what it means to have influence. Influence is not popularity. Influence is to have a stake in heaven. To the degree that you can move the hand of God on it. A man of influence can alter the civilization of the world. Daniel was in Babylon. They were in captivity for 70 years. But when he went on his knees, something happened. The angel Gabriel showed up. He said, I was giving ability to fly swiftly. To give you skill and understanding. Because there's no salvation for Israel unless a man dwells on the altar. He said, then, man, if not the civilization that came was raising would have swept up the earth realm into darkness. The only way light came back was because a man of influence by the name Enosh raised a people and he said, man, began to call upon the name of the Lord. In Genesis chapter 6 verse 5, the Bible said, the thought of man was continually evil and it repented God that he created man. God regretted and he said he will wipe out the whole human race, including the beasts and the animals. But suddenly, there was a man that knows the technology of priesthood. His name was, was, uh, was Noah. And he said, Noah found grace with God. You will think grace is favor. Until after he came out of the ark, in Genesis chapter 8 verse 20, then he now told us the technology that made Noah to access grace from the heights of Zion. He said, Noah, build an altar. If there was no altar on earth, God would have wiped away the whole earth. That's a man of influence and an influence that comes by priesthood. Can we sink unless men rise in prayer? Church doesn't save a generation. It is prayer that saves a generation. Men were corrupt. Another dark agent rose by the name Nimrod. He raised a city that was high into heaven and God had to scatter it. And there was no hope anymore. And God found Abraham. The only way Abraham could gain influence in Zion. Because Abraham thought life was about family fraternity. My uncle is a millionaire. My auntie works with Chevron. My brother is in NMPC. He said, depart from your kingdom. Leave your country. Leave your kindred. Leave your father's house. I want to save the world now. But there is no way I can save the world with this kind of system. So he took Abraham away from his family. Abraham still carried Lot because he didn't know that what God wanted to do was to give him a name among spirits. What God wanted to do was to give him badges among the ranking cherubs of glory. God wanted him to be popular in the immortal realm so that he can move the hand of God on earth. He thought it was family fraternity. So in Genesis chapter 12 verse 6, he carried him to a land called Sichem. From Sikhen, he carried him to More. From More, he carried him to Ai. From Ai, he carried him to Bethel. I told you yesterday that Sikhen means shoulder. It's a place of body. God wanted to bring him a new kind of education. More means teacher. So God taught him body so that he can understand how to trust the spirit. And the moment Abraham was able to trust God, the first thing that Abraham did in Genesis chapter 12 verse 7 is what? He raised an altar. When prayer begins to rise from earth, then earth is about to see an intervention of Zion. This is how God preserved the earth realm. When you say you are the salt of the earth, he's not talking to all believers. He's talking to men that own altars. Because earth is preserved by prayer. That was how Daniel delivered Israel in Babylon. That was how Moses delivered Israel in Egypt. Only by prayer that men can rise with a voice that heaven can listen to. But we are taught only how to ask for bread. So every time we pray, it's Lord, school fees, Lord, car, Lord, my health. We don't know how to preserve the earth. The reason we are small is because we have not known how to maximize prayer. The body of Christ have not fully articulated the scope and power of prayer. Sometimes when God wants to save a generation and men are not enough, He allows them to explore prayer. A man Jesus came into this world. Nobody had stature enough to give him back up. He will carry his apostles to pray, they will be sleeping. So he went to the mountain in Matthew chapter 17, verse 2. And he said, As he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. His raiment began to blister. And he said, Suddenly, there stood with him Moses and Elias. Do you know what was going on? Jesus was importing people from another generation. Those men are intercessors. What he wants to do now, no man of sufficient stature is on earth to create a quorum. 
So the only way quorum could be accomplished was for him to go and fraternize with the spirit of just men made perfect. That's where men become bigger than mantles. They become systems. When a man is talking, he's talking with the voice of a clan. By prayer, you can enter into the company of the Enochs. And when you talk, you will talk with the wisdom of Enoch. By prayer, you can enter into the womb of life where Daniel dwells. And the possibilities that Daniel saw, you don't carry his mantle, but you will exercise those possibilities. Because you have become a member of that family. You are a member of a clan. So you enter a city, you can be one man, but you can scatter the foundation of darkness. Because the powers that back you, when you talk, you talk with the voice of many. You talk with the voice of many. Men of prayer don't die. They live forever. If you begin to pray now, you will be shocked that one day in prayer, you will see Babalola standing with you. Not because he came to give you an impartation. You have entered his family in the spirit. And when you come back, when you come back to this world, people will see the dimensions of Babalola at work in you. You know, when I began to follow Apostle Adam, some people thought I was trying to talk like him. I know what priesthood is about because I suffered. When I went to Remnant, I prayed for Apostle every day for one hour, 30 minutes. Apart from listening to his messages for eight hours. Until I became a part of his clan. He doesn't need to impart me. I am a part of that family in the spirit. And on my birthday, he called me and said, You are my son. God showed him in the spirit. This guy broke into that family. You are the one pursuing after people to impart them. I don't need to pursue a man. I pursued them for many years. I didn't walk in their dimension. Until I knew that in the spirit I can access the gate where a man speaks from. That is how Moses was able by prayer to enter into where Jacob was standing in the spirit. Moses was not, he was not a patriarch in Israel. He was from the, family, the tribe of Levi. You don't talk when Abraham, Isaac and Jacob speak. But by prayer he went to the mountains of God and he entered where Jacob stood. And the Bible said Moses is the king of Jeshurun. And on the strength of where he entered, even though Jacob cursed Reuben, and the utterance of Jacob, he said, until Shiloh comes, Moses entered the same location, and he said, let Reuben live and not die. I can talk from where he's talking from. So I will have the results that he has. Prayer. You think you are one man. You don't know your tribe in the spirit. When you begin to rise in the spirit, then you will see possibilities that are bigger than an anointing. You can come to a location and when you talk, it is angels that walk. Did you not read about Daniel? He prayed for 21 days and the point came, what Daniel was saying on earth, it was my care that was fighting in heaven. Fraternity in the spirit by prayer. Prayer, prayer. You don't know priesthood, you can't be popular. Men can clap for you, but you can't change your civilization. You can't alter the topography of your generation. The men that have a voice that echo in the heights of Zion are the men that know fraternity in the spirit by prayer. When they talk, you will be amazed. Sometimes we speak and the people think we are followers of Joshua Selma. I have only heard four of his messages and I attended one of his meetings when he came to BSU. But I know where he stands in the spirit. A day will come when we will speak and we will see the reality of 30 men because we speak as a tribe. We speak as a company. We speak as a clan. The reason there is jealousy on earth is because we don't meet in heaven. If we by prayer, if by prayer we begin to meet in heaven, a day will come when in our own generation we will have meeting, you will see Lawrence Oyo. You will see Theophilus Sunday. You will see Apostle Lawa Suleiman. You will see, you will see Tolu Agwola. You will see Chidebere Amano. You will see Steve Smith. Every young man that holds a torch in this generation, we will gather together because we have seen ourselves in the spirit. So on earth, there is no need for competition. We can come for a conference and we sound that what God wants to do in this conference is related to sound. So all of us who are apostles, we sit down and we will allow Lawrence, Theophilus and Michael say to minister. Because what heaven is doing is sound. It's not allocated to teaching. Competition die when men pray. Because true family is born in the spirit. True fraternity is born in the spirit. True company is raised in the spirit. God wants to raise an army. The numbering system is not on earth. It's in Zion. If your name is there, then the season begins to open upon your life. And that is when it doesn't matter where you come from. Some of us were from lands of obscurity. The city where I came from, it is, I wonder if it's on the map. All you hear are bad news. 
You don't even imagine how you can talk to people in three states. But the spirit appeared to me. He said, I will begin to announce you. And if I cough in a meeting, people are blessed in America. Because it's a spirit function. It's a component of reality that is born in the womb of the spirit. You don't know who you are until you can travel in Zion. Fame and influence is born in the spirit. The Bible said Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. What was he doing? He was fasting and praying. When he returned, the city he entered flourished with light. He became a colossus among men. If paraventure we ask you now who you are, the best you will tell us is your name. Meanwhile, you don't have a name until God gives you a name. They may call you promise for 10 years. But when God gives you a name, that name will begin to echo. <laughs> you are coming to a place, people don't know how they migrate. They shut down everything to come and hear you. Not because you are saying anything different. God has given you a name. You are popular in the realm of the spirit. Here at Deboe, our precious papa was coming to Makodi. We shut down everything we were doing. I didn't know why I was going for the crusade. He has a name. Such men have influence in the spirit. But God will break you so that he can teach you the path of legislation. That's what he did to Jacob. He broke him. And he said as a prince, thou hast power with God and with men and hast prevailed. Men that have power in the realm of the spirit are men that commit their lives perpetually to the way of the altar. Where is your altar? You may not have even located it. By altars! Your name can be immortalized. You can raise children. They will have no choice but to serve God. This is not a counseling. You banish darkness from their soul before they are born. When they come to this world, they will have no choice. Did you not read about Jacob that he was a swindler? All he needed to do was to walk through Bethel. And the day his head came upon the altar that his father built in Bethel, he was arrested. I am not preaching because I love God. I was a vagabond. I enjoyed sin and the ways of the flesh. But my mother had concentrated me. I had no choice. It was in the club one day when I was dancing that light came out of the wall. We went to that party where several, but I was the only one that saw the light because there were covenants backing me up. A woman gave up her life in prayer and said, God, use this one. I can't be lost. My destiny was already insured before I was born. You don't know prayer. That's why you joke with your life. You will have no name and identity in this realm unless you enter heaven by prayer. Prayer is beyond asking God for bread and wine. It's a technology of relevance in the spirit. Who are you? I came tonight to sound an alarm in Zion. Ha! You want to pray? This is the time. When you are there, when you are there, when you are there, when you are dead, when you are dead, when you are dead, when you are dead, when you are dead. for purpose is not the energy of the flesh. Maybe you didn't read the story of Catherine Kuman. Most of you are ten times stronger than her. But she entered something in heaven. A point came where Catherine Kuman could pace the floor for 18 hours. The more she prayed, the more she entered. Until she begins to soar in the spirit. Somebody entered her prayer room and found her gliding in the air. She was floating. She was floating. She doesn't need the energy of mortality. It's an economy in the immortal dimension. But you can only catch it by prayer. You may say you are not educated. Sweet Wiggles word did not know how to read until he was 47. He was only taught to read the Bible. And even at the old age, his daughter was reading for him. He had nothing to do with your intellect. What is the level of grace you can apprehend? And how high can you fly in Zion? Come on, go ahead and pray in tongues. Hey! Pray the Holy Ghost. Are you tired of the statue? Are you tired? Are you tired? 
this is a mountain of a in the spirit because we are in dire need of corporate ranking as we begin to pray now the man of God will enter the congregation and hold hands with you and pray with some of you something is about to happen as we do it in the earth in the heaven most of you will begin to have encounters you will find your clan you will find your company in Zion you will find your partners in heaven come on go ahead and pray the Holy Ghost Oh, my God. 
Christ. If you are sick in your body, place your hands there. God wants to raise functionaries. You are sick. Put your hands there. Listen. As I pray for the sick, there is a fire that will engulf you. Most of you will catch a fire. Because you are not just going to be healed, you will carry a mantle of healing from this place. Holy Spirit of God. In the name of Jesus, I arrest every spirit of infirmity, every chain of sickness. I come against you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Right now, I command the chains from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. Be broken in the name of Jesus. Every spirit of infirmity, I charge you right now, out of them, out of them, out of them. Come on, go ahead and speak in the Holy Ghost. Speak in tongues. I in my spirit now he says there shall be a festival of fire listen most of you are about to contact a white fire a white fire a festival of fire father in the name of Jesus Such as I have received from you, Lord, the fire for revival, the fire, the flames of revival, such as I have received from you, Lord, from the left of this hall, to the right, from the front, to the back, Holy Spirit of God. Release the same fire. Let the revival begin to arise. Oh, stop the sound. There are angels that walk in the midst of the coals of fire. They are the ones that set men on fire. Right now, those angels are about to anoint people. Men carrying flaming swords of fire. Your tongue will become a sword. The utterance from your lips will become a flame of fire. And so Holy Spirit of God, we are the revivalists that you are clothing with fire. Ora saparias. Eamanatua. Zopoporos kapai. Baletais kuatana. Elelele. 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 Touch them Lord. Touch them Lord. Touch them Lord. Felila compre satala pariada tas. Felicons e preto soria. Feliz ali capanas. Hombre so solila capayata. Se le pandre pare de gisco predacas. 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 Sali capande panas. Hele capose si la hai.
things of God are at different levels of intelligence. Every entity that is factored into the realm of creation operates at different levels of intelligence. But what gives humankind relevance it's not the level of intelligence that we function. It is the class that we belong. We belong in the God class. And on the strength of that, we relate at the level of God and we interact with spirit entities. So you are functioning and interacting every day, not just with physical and visible creation. You are interacting with spirit beings at different rank and different layer and dimensions of operation. It will be an error and an outright act of folly to think that you will live just the way you want. The thoughts that come to your mind, the things that you feel, most of them are traffics from different spirits operating at different dimensions. The reason you see things go in your life, the direction it goes, is because of the spirits you fraternize with and the allegiances you caught in the realms of the spirit. Many are not aware, but your ignorance is not an excuse. We saw in the morning that relationship with God is at different levels. There is a level of a servant, a level of a disciple, a level of a friend, and the level of a son. But tonight, I want to show you a higher a level of operation in the spirit. It is called priesthood. <laughs> many are not taught, many are not instructed, and they don't know why their life is a disaster. Because different spirits have access into their lives. And they are manipulated as puppets in the hands of spirits. Tonight, the Lord is going to bring somebody deliverance. Go ahead and tell the Lord to speak to you. We don't have time. Tell the Lord to speak to you tonight. Saprahale kapas. Sikobrina salila flakta palimo morondo sadias. Shaka patalia pratiza zalakata. Selega paprondo sozila prahalakiras. Selega paradira sondre hastis. Vela kafaliga vas. Kombra hast. Kombra hast. Kombra hast. Taliga vobre diske la paras. Selele sa libra banosia. Obra seta kapali atalima pandras. Casting crowns. Lifting heads. Now we know is all we've come to do. Help me choir. Adonai. Adonai, 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 of a spirit the reason you desire companionship the reason you desire love the reason you desire relationship is because my projection of the reality of a spirit 
The same way you have desire for intimacy. That is how spirits have desire for relationship. That is how spirits have desire for intimacy. Every time of your life, you are at the junction of accepting the invitation of a spirit. Whether you will go in the direction of God or not, is your choice. Tonight, we want to learn the way of priesthood. You will know what it means to waste your life for God. Because it's a life that is wasted to God that will have a relevance in eternity. Many are living for themselves because they don't understand the demands of intimacy. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name. You may be seated. I will open the scriptures for very few minutes before we begin the impartation. Because tonight is not necessarily a night of doctrine. Our world is falling apart. And the fracas of this damaged creation can only be put together by people that have understanding of kingdom oppression. Very many are living for themselves. There are only few that the father can entrust with bodies. Very few understand the way of priesthood. So the future, the faith, and the destiny of creation is resting in the hand of those few. That's why you come into a territory, you hear few voices. Because only those ones have the certification of Zion. There are many that their life is still a prized and a choice possession. In priesthood, we are taught how to waste our life for God. In priesthood, we are taught how to sacrifice our ambition. Because we understand there is no life except the will of the Father is met. That was the dimension that Jesus came to steward and to reveal to us. Coming to a point where you no longer live for yourself. Coming to a point where you understand that there is a mandate that was factored into your life by the intelligence of the divine. It was designed before the foundations of the world. You came into a puzzle and you came too late. The time you showed up is too late for you to begin to be creative about your life. You have been summoned into an assignment, a corridor that spans through many generations. Some of you, the callings upon your life, there are many hundred patriarchs that walk that corridor before you were summoned. It is too late for you to become creative. The path that you are walking in, some of you, is the path that men like Babalola hewed. So when you come, that anointing, that ordination, we gather you, it will compare you to walk in a certain direction. That's why most of us, we go to school, but very few will use our certificates. In the days to come, sons of order will rise. But these are men that have understood the voice of ordination. They have understood the need in the heart of the Father. They know that their life is not something they will hold tight to. Their life is something they are willing to give to God any day, any time. It's the way of priesthood. Demons and principalities, we have a few days unless sons arise. Many are not taught and they are not instructed that spirits are fully involved in this thing. You are actually in a league of spirits. Every time you talk, you think or you feel there was a spirit that whispered and shot it into your emotion. You may go on Facebook and you think you are looking for a good girl. You don't have understanding. There's a spirit that wants to give expression to the desires of sex. And you are the only vessel through which it can find expression. It's just like wearing a hand glove. Everything that hand glove does is what your hand is doing. The hand glove in itself is only a vessel that contains the dimensions of your hand. Our lives are vessels that contain spirits. When we come to the altar of priesthood, what we are doing is that we are yielding ourselves to God to be used as vessels to shape our world. Your lives will be shaped by it. Your families will be shaped by it. Your territory will be shaped by it. If priesthood is not part of your life, you can't live in this kingdom. Because in the kingdom we talk about entities, ranking entities. In the kingdom we talk about laws, we talk about ordinances, we talk about protocols. It has nothing to do with ambition. There is no ambition in the kingdom. In the kingdom, only the will of the king prevails. And until a man comes to a point where he can envelop the possibilities of that king and give expression to him, he can live in the kingdom. That is why sons don't live in the kingdom. Only priests and kings live there. If you come into sonship, you must take the responsibility of priesthood before you survive in this kingdom. Have you not seen why most of you, your ambitions, your priorities cannot come to pass? Because a kingdom is not meant for people of appetites. 
A kingdom is not meant for people of ambition. A kingdom is not meant for people of desire. Only kings and priests live in this kingdom. The Bible said in Exodus 19 verse 4 and 5, He said, don't you see how I carried you on my wings from the Egyptians? And I brought you unto myself. The goal of God is intimacy with him. He wants you to live with him intimately the way a man lives with a woman. He wants you to live with him, giving expression to his desires. He said, I brought you unto myself. And the reason I brought you to myself is so that you can hear my voice and obey my covenants. And he said, when you do that, you will become a choice to people. What makes you a choice to person in the eyes of God is the degree to which you hear his voice and obey his covenant. But unfortunately, there are many Christians that don't even know the voice of God. When you interact with Christians, they are asking you questions like people who are lost because we have not entered the kingdom. And he said, I will make you a kingdom of priests and of kings. You are living in a kingdom and until you become a priest and a king, you will not survive because there are demons. There are principalities. There are powers. There are rulers of the darkness of this world. There are spiritual wickedness and high priests. Don't you see why you are begging God for things? Even things God has given you, you can't express them. Many of us are sick. Jesus has paid the price for your healing. Why are you still sick? Because there is a prince that fights against health. Many of us are righteous because the price of righteousness has been paid and the nature of righteousness has been downloaded into our spirit. Why are you still living in sin? Because there is a principality that is a facilitator of sin. Priesthood is the way forward. If you don't know priesthood, you can't survive. If you don't know priesthood, you can't live in this kingdom. Many of us are prophets. Why are you not manifesting? Because there is a spirit. He's called Jezebel. He wants to corrupt your prophetic eyes. Until priesthood is born, there is no future. The men that have future in this kingdom are men that come to the gate of priesthood. Without priesthood, you can't survive. You can go to Harvard. You can school in the best universities in the world. The principalities don't care about your certificate. You can be a first class graduate, but you'll be a waste on the street. Because even God says you are a great man, there is a spirit that will resist you. It is only in priesthood that we challenge darkness. It's in priesthood that we enforce the will of God. Many, many are wasting away. Christianity has become a religion. Christianity has become a cliche. A cliche where people talk talk big things. They don't understand that we are relating with spirits. Priesthood, it will change you. It will change your world. When you yield, let me show you. The best way to illustrate priesthood is the tabernacle. The tabernacle. The tabernacle is depictive of the three constitutions of your being. Your spirit, your soul, your body. There are businesses in the kingdom that you can carry out only with your body. There are businesses in this kingdom that you can carry out only with your soul. There are businesses in this kingdom that you can carry out only with your spirit. Priesthood is that economy God that impacts your body, your soul, and your spirit. Demons are interested in your soul because your soul is the region of your expression. God created your spirit. He formed your body. He did nothing about your soul. Your soul became. Because the soul is the product of the interaction between the spirit and the body. And anybody that gets hold of the soul rules the man. And that's why demons fight your soul. If they get your emotions, if they get your mind, if they get your will, you are a puppet. Because the soul is the region of your expression. Only on the altar of priesthood can your soul be brought under the government of the Holy Spirit. And until your soul is arrested by God, you have no future with God. Because spirits only work with yielded vessels. To what degree are you yielded? It's a revelation of the quality of life you are living. And it's also the sign of where you will be. When the annals of Zion open in eternity, where you will stand in the world to come is a function of your degree of alliance with the Holy Ghost. But there are many Christians that are living their lives far away from God. They don't even know when they heard the voice of God because we are not taught the way of priesthood. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Father. You are seated on the tree. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Father. Only believers. 
Only believers, only souls can engage the altar. The altar is the place of interfacing between spirit and man. The altar is the point of encounter where spiritual entities can rest in the natural. The altar is the only infrastructure in the natural world that can host the dimension of the spirit. So when you want to have intercourse, when you, when you want to engage the spirit, the point of engagement is called the altar. And that is why only sons can travel in that corridor. Before you enter into the tabernacle, there is something that must happen to you. You must have met Jesus. You must have known the Christ because the gate of the tabernacle is a revelation of the four offices of Jesus. There are four colors on that gate. It is purple, white, blue, and scarlet. It's a revelation of Jesus the King, Jesus the Servant, Jesus the Son of God, and Jesus eternal life. When you encounter Jesus, what happens is that you are ushered into priesthood. The first thing God wants you to do is to come into priesthood. God did not save you because he wants to give you a car. God did not save you because he wants to give you health. God did not save you because he wants to give you anything. God saved you because he wants you to have relevance with him in the world to come and in this life. So the first thing you see when you are saved is that you are ushered into priesthood. That's why the moment you enter the gate, the first thing you see is the altar of sacrifice. Everything that happened at the gate is based on the finished works of Jesus. He was the one who died. He was the one who took the shame. He was the one who was crucified. He was the one who resurrected so that you and I can come into intimacy with God. There was no basis for relationship because we were dead and God is a living God. He cannot relate with the dead man. What brought you back to life was the finished works of Jesus. And the moment that work was perfected, the gate of priesthood opened for you. The reason you came into priesthood is because Jesus gave you life. That life ushers you into priesthood. I see a lot of Christians now that talk about living what they want to do, doing what they want to do. They don't understand the kingdom. The kingdom is not a place where you do what you want to do. The kingdom is a place where you serve the will of God. According as it is written concerning you, the Bible spoke of David. He said after he has served his generation, according to the will of God, he slept with his fathers. Everything David lived all his life was written in one phrase, serving the will of God. Jesus said in the volume of the books, it is written of me, I come to do thy will. Life is not doing what you want. Life is finding the will of God and doing it. And there was no way you would have been able to do that because you were dead in trespasses. But when Jesus died and resurrected, he opened the gate of intimacy for you so that you can have a relationship with God. That relationship is not God, I love you. Because spirits are not men. Men, what they call love is affection. What men call love is gifts. But what spirits call love is obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Because spirit thinks differently from men. You think love is affection. But the spirit calls love obedience. So if you have not come into a place of the service of the will of God, you don't know what love is. You don't know what relationship is. And you don't know what life is. You begin to live the day you begin to have a relationship with God. That is separation from God. Uh, who is ready tonight to hear the protocol of priesthood? <laughs> hey, many of us are not living, brother. You think you are pretty not sitting, so you are alive. In the realm of the spirit, you come alive when you begin to do the will of God. <laughs> you will not be visible. Hey, the radar, the radar will not pick you. Do you know when planes fly? If you want to trace a plane, what you do is that you look at the radar. If the object is there, you see it. The radar, the radar that reveals you in the kingdom of God is your degree of alignment to his will. If you are not living the will of God, you will not appear on the radar of life. That's why you will perish. And that's why even if you enter the kingdom, you will not be relevant. Because only men of the will of God appear in the radar. In the radar. When the radar is open, they won't find you. On earth, you will be called Barnabas. And you may be the JCC president, but in the later, in the later, you will not appear. You may be called Mkonzi, the winner of the beauty pageant. Everybody on campus talks about you, but spirits will not know you. When they call your name, they will say, who is that? Who is that? Who is Mkonzi? You are not popular among the immortals. But men that fulfill the will of God, they are popular in heaven. When you call their name, heaven will rise. They will say, I know Abraham. 
I know Abraham. I know Abraham. I know Abraham. Heaven will look up. When they wanted to kill Stephen, Jesus stood up from his statue. He stood up from his throne. And he looked at Stephen. He said, no, no, no. Forgive them. Those men are popular in heaven. When you touch them, heaven moves. When you fight them, heaven moves. Because they are popular. They are popular among the mortals. I want to live as a man who has stature in the name of the Spirit. There were men that walked this life. Why they were on earth, they were like immortals. When they speak heaven move, you can't fight them. In 1980, when Pets in wanted to organize the first crusade, Buhari said, no way. He said, are you okay? You can't stop an immortal being. I don't take instruction from you. I hear the voice of Zion. He called his friend Rehad Bonke. He said, do you want to do a crusade? He said, come over. And they had a crusade in the battle. And they packed out one million people. That was the first time Rehad Bonke ministered to one million people. Because there's a man on earth that is called an immortal. His name is Pensi Itahosa. When you call him, heaven move. That's the order of priesthood. You become relevant when priesthood becomes part of your life. What is priesthood? You want to speak in tongues for one minute? You want to speak in tongues so that your spirit can catch it? You want to catch a lampano? You want to catch it? In the spirit, we catch. We don't hear. We don't hear. We catch. We catch. In the spirit, we catch. The word is called Catalampano. You may hold. Susu Supas. Susu Supas. Hey, hey, hey. Catch it, catch it, catch it, catch it. A revelation is coming in your direction. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Many people come to me. They call me, they chat me, and they say, Man of God, help me. I'm in sin. I want to serve God. I can't. The cure is priesthood. I'm living in sin. There's nothing I can do about it. The cure is priesthood. It's not the prayer of a man of God. They may pour a drum of oil on you. You will still live in secrecy. I want to do the will of God. The cure is priesthood. Did you read the life of Jesus? He leaves a crusade and the next thing he goes to the top of the mountain. And prays all night. People are gathered to hear him. He escapes through the back door. And he goes to the mountain to pray all night. The Bible says early in the morning. Before the cool of the day. He went to a solitary place where he prays. Why do you think Jesus was the way he was? He understood priesthood. He was not mighty because he was the son of God. You and I are also the son of God. The difference between you and Jesus is priesthood. He's priesthood. He's priesthood. The difference is priesthood. Many are not men that order, follow the order of priesthood. 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 Shakakata. You want your life to turn around. It's priesthood. Most of us are prophets. We are apostles. We are mighty politicians, leaders, generals. But we will never enter there. It's by priesthood. In this kingdom, there's one way to prosper. It's called priesthood. Because only priests live in the kingdom. The kingdom was not divine, designed for disciples. It was not designed for sons. It was not designed for friends. It was not designed for servants. It was designed for priests. He said, unto you, unto him that have washed us and made us kings and priests. Unto him that have washed us and made us kings and priests. He said, I will make you a kingdom of priests and kings. If you are not a king, if you are not a priest, you can't live in this kingdom. You may be the friend of God, that's beautiful, but the kingdom is not for friends. You may be the servant of God, that's great, but the kingdom is not for servant. You may be the wise son of God, that's beautiful, but the kingdom is not for soul. The kingdom is for priests and kings. That's why your life is not working. You want your life to begin to work, you must come to the gates of Zion. What is priesthood? Priesthood is the ability to connect to heaven on earth. Priesthood is the ability to wield the powers of heaven on earth. Priesthood is kingdom legislation and litigation. 
Your ability to move the kingdom forward is what we call priesthood. Your ability to judge the works of darkness on earth as a custodian of the authority of heaven is what we call priesthood. How do you get into that authority? The first thing is that God must walk himself into you. If God is not walked into a man, the man cannot walk God out. Only men whom God is walked into can walk God out. There are many Christians who are calling God, talking the name of God and with titles. They only bring reproach to the name of God. Because when the principality shows up, they become a puppet. A puppet. A puppet. A puppet. Because they don't know the way of priesthood. They don't know the way of priesthood. Kingdom legislation. Kingdom legislation begins with you. That's why I told you, the moment you enter the courts, the first thing you see is the altar of sacrifice. That's when you die. Tell somebody you must die. You must die. You see that your ambition of becoming Miss Nigeria, you must die. That your ambition of becoming the first pilot from Edo, you must die. That your ambition of becoming the richest man, you must die. Tell somebody you must die. When you die to self, even when you become the richest man, your money is not for show. Your money becomes a trust that is used to advance the kingdom. When you die, if you become the most beautiful woman, it will not be a pageant. It will be an avenue to reach out to people. When you die, everything you have becomes a kingdom resource and your life itself becomes a kingdom arsenal. You become an artillery, a garrison of God. Every time God wants to fight, all he needs to do is to fetch it to you and he will bring out a grenade. All he needs to do is to fetch it to you. He will bring out a double barrel because you are dead. Your hand is an extension of God. Your mouth is an extension of God. Your thought is an extension of God. Your words are extensions of God. That's why the apostles prayed. They said that you may stretch forth thy hands through us. They understood something. They are dead to flesh. So when they stretch their hand, their hand becomes the hand of God. When Moses stretched his rod, his rod becomes the rod of God. Because the man had understood the economy of death. Once upon a time, Moses was happy that he was a prince of Egypt. Once upon a time, Moses was happy that he was the son of Pharaoh's daughter. But the Bible said when Moses was come of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to suffer affliction with the people of God. This guy left the palace as a prince. He went into the wilderness and became a shepherd for many years. But when he came back, the Bible said in Exodus chapter 7 verse 1, he said, Behold, I have made you a God unto Pharaoh. If he was in Egypt, he would have been a prince in the courts of Pharaoh. But he went to the backside of the desert. He understood the will of death and he returned. Instead of a prince, he became a God. He's called the way of priesthood. The way of priesthood. Demons will mess your family up until priesthood rises on your inside. Some come, they say, hey, there are four of us. My elder sister is 35. The second one is 33. I am 31. The other one is 29. We are not getting married. There's a demon correlated over your family. What that demon needs is not the intervention of God. It's the rise of a priest. Because God has intervened. But there's no man on earth to say restore. 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 It's the way of priesthood. That appetite you will not give up is your grave. Satan will put an appetite in your hand. That appetite will become your grave. Some of us, Facebook is our grave. WhatsApp is our grave. Instagram is our grave. Some of us, shoes are our grave. Our looks is our grave. The mascara is your grave because it has become your God. You must give up the appetite if you will reign among men. It's called the way of priesthood. The way of priesthood. The way of priesthood. You die on the altar of sacrifice. You hold on to the horn of the altar until you give up your ambition. I graduated from the university in 2011. My goal was to be a military officer. But the day the letter came to become a naval officer, that time I had died. Because as a military officer, I will only move with pride with all the ranks. But as a preacher, I will change the lives of millions. Today, there are many thousands, tens of thousands. They call me every morning to seek the direction for their lives. That is not a platform I could have as a naval officer. I choose the way of death. Some of you is politics, but if you don't die before you get there, you will become the next corruption of Nigeria. But if you die, if you die, the story about you will be told like Jesus in the land of Zebulun, in the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentile, the people that sat in darkness, behold, they have seen a great light. When you enter into the political corridor, you will not be a governor, you will be the witness of Zion. You will be the important pillar that is instituted to bring
bring witness to the name of Jesus. The people that were looting money, when they look at you, they will run away. But you stay away of priesthood. Some of you, you are in a room with people who are lesbians, club addicts. Instead of changing them, they change you. You came in hundred level as a decent lady, but now you are the slave queen because there's no priesthood in your life. You have become a puppet in the hand of Jezebel. The Leviathan has caught you and you can no longer be relevant. But if you will change your steps tonight and hog the altar of sacrifice, things can change because it's never too late with Jesus. He was the one that factored your being. The dimensions of your spirit, he designed it in the theater. He fashioned you, he formed you. He knows your abilities, your proclivities, your attitudinalities. He knows it because he designed you. Any day you come back, he can be on you the light of his glory. And as we behold, we are changed. As we behold, we are changed. Then suddenly, a harlot becomes an evangelist. Suddenly, a criminal becomes a prophet. Why? Because as we behold, we are changed. As we look upon him, we are changed. When you look at me, you don't longer see a man. You see Christ in me, the hope of glory. Because it is the mystery of the age that men mortars will become custodians of the dimensions of the mortal spirit. That men mortars will become the proof that God is real. That men mortars will become the extension of the corridors of Zion to the natural world. It is the man who accepts the way of priesthood. The way of priesthood. The way of priesthood. The sacrifice will cost you hunger. It will cost you money. It will cost you hours of prayer. You will give up friends. You will give up many things. I had many friends in the university. They called me Skywide because I was a football analyst. I knew all the records of Asana. I know when they were founded. I know all the matches they played. I could quote you a match in 1976 when they played the Champions League match. I could tell you everyone that won the Champions League for 100 years. But something happened. When the light of God beamed upon me, I dropped the flesh. I dropped the appetite. I dropped the ways of the world so that I could become a proof that God is alive. You hear him, he becomes like an immortal. He speaks and you no longer sleep. Your sleep is taken away from you because his voice is not just a product of mental intelligence. His voice is an echo from Zion. There are men that speak and they are amplifiers to the voice of God. They are amplifiers. Every time God wants to speak, they show up. They show up. And then you hear in the scriptures, he said, the word of the Lord came to me. The guy was in the cave. He was in the wilderness. But God wants to talk in the palace. And suddenly the anointing carries him. And he shows up. And he said, the word of the Lord came to me. That means there's nobody in the palace that can traffic the voice of God. The voice of God will be scarce unless that man shows up. He is the connector between eternity and earth. He is the connector between the spirit realm and the natural. Why? Because he embraced the altar of sacrifice. That desire, that appetite you are holding on to, that is what will kill you. It's an intelligence of the demonic to make you irrelevant forever. And when time is accomplished, you will realize that a hundred years is like a moment in eternity. Moses looked upon the veils and the vistas of eternity were open. And in the matter of 40 days, Moses saw everything that happened before God began to create the world. And he saw the things that will happen when he dies. Why? Because life is a moment. If the windows of eternity are open to you, you can see what will happen in the next hundred years. Does that not suggest to you that you don't waste your life? You think you are living for 80 years and you think it's long life. No, no, no. What counts is not long life. What counts is the life that is in your days. Many are weak. Many are beggarly. Many are puppets because they have not embraced the way of priesthood. The altar of sacrifice. This is not a doctrine. This is you yielding consistently to the progressive instructions of the Holy Ghost. It tells you today no food, no food. No Facebook for one month, no Facebook for one month. It's called the altar of sacrifice. And until you embrace the altar of sacrifice, you are not a reasonable Christian. Paul said, you dearly beloved, presenting your body as a living sacrifice. When you begin to do that, then you become a reasonable Christian. There are many unreasonable people walking in the courts of God. Many unreasonable people. When God wants to speak, their mouth is sealed. When God wants to give, their pocket is sealed. When God wants intercession to rise to heaven, they are sleeping and slumbering on their bed. They have not embraced the way of sacrifice. And until sacrifice becomes the organogram of your life, you have no future with God. 
When you journey past the altar of sacrifice, you come to the lava. It is in the lava that the sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost begins to walk. In the lava, you have the waters of the Spirit. It begins to wash you. Yes, yes, yes. You were a smoker. You were a smoker. You desire to smoke. You were raped when you were a child. So you have become lustful concerning sex. When you come to the altar, the lava, then the Holy Ghost begins to wash your soul. And like the psalmist, you will say, The Lord restore it, my soul. So suddenly, a woman who does not see handsome men and go away, or a man who does not see fair ladies and turn his eyes, even if a naked one stands, he doesn't notice. Why? The lava. He has been washed. He said that thou mightest cleanse her by washing with water by the word of God. That's the function of the lava. Before the priest enter the inner courts to carry the axe of priesthood, he must be washed in the lava. You must be washed. It is a washing, the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. This is not a doctrine. This is an organic life. You come to that point where the Holy Ghost purges you every morning. Every morning, you hear his voice. Every morning, he speaks to you. And from the whispers of the Spirit, he tells you what to do. Jesus said, the words I have spoken to you, they have washed you. There's a technology in God where your soul can be restored. You know, psychology said the soul can never be restored. A man who has had sex before, he had had an experience of sin. No matter how he tries, that thing is like a backdrop. Do you see this thing? This is a backdrop. There's no way you will look at me and you will not see this backdrop. A man who has gained experiential knowledge of sin, that sin becomes a backdrop. The only thing that will remove that backdrop is the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit. That's why we seek Him every morning in prayer. Every morning, we go to Him and we say, Lord, wash us. Cleanse us afresh. Because there is a service that we must carry out. It's called the sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost. There are many who don't have a relationship with the Holy Ghost because they are afraid. When you come there, He will tell you the things you don't want to do. Maybe the first thing He will tell you is, no makeup again. Ah! The lady has barbed all her eyelashes. So if she doesn't do the artificial makeup, she will become like a baboon. But the Holy Ghost say, no makeups again. If you will travel deep with God, that will become the compass of your life. We don't go deeper in the spirit because we read the Bible. We go deeper in the spirit because we obey the voice of God. leave the earth to worship you I leave the earth to worship you I leave the earth to worship you no one else like you no one beside you I leave the earth to worship you. When you complete this process, what has happened is that your flesh has been tamed. This time you can now go and serve the living God. You know, Paul said you should be reasonable. Everything that Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1 to Romans chapter 11 is about the finished works of Jesus. From Romans 1 to Romans 9, to Romans 8, he reveals to you what Jesus did for you. How that the cross paid for your sin. How that the blood washes your sin away. And how that you don't need anything to be the righteousness of God. From Romans 9 to Romans 11, he reveals what Jesus did to save the Jews. But from Romans 12, he tells you what you must do. That place is a place of service. When the Holy Ghost succeeds in taming your flesh, then you come to the inner courts. It's in the inner courts that you begin to strengthen the soul because the soul doesn't understand the ways of God so the first thing you meet is called the table of shoe bread did you remember in Luke when they were journeying through the path of Emmaus the Bible said as he broke the bread their eyes opened and they recognized him that he was the Christ there are many of you that read the Bible today it's like a novel you are trying to read it you can't understand it you don't know why you read then you sleep off Every time you try to read, you say, okay, from now, I will read the Bible. And then you carry the Bible, you begin to read, and it doesn't make sense. The reason it doesn't make sense is because the man who can open the scripture 
is the man that his flesh has been tamed. A disobedient man to the Holy Ghost cannot obey the scripture because the spirit is called the spirit of revelation. Paul said, I pray for you in the, F in the church of Ephesians. He said that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. Be enlightened. The word is for tizzo. For tizzo. The Lord opens the scriptures for you. So when you open it, it becomes sweet. That's when you read the Bible and it's sweet. You hear the word of God and it's sweet. Something has happened. Your soul has been reconfigured. The Bible said in Jeremiah 15, 16, it said, I found thy word. I did eat them and they became the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. If the word of God doesn't make sense, it's because you are disobedient. The moment your obedience is fulfilled and you enter into the inner court, you confront the altar of your bread and the bread of life begins to open. And as you eat it, you become strong. That's when you go out you see your friends that you go to club with for the past four years and they say man today is friday we go purple and you say no i don't feel like going you know what the appetite is dead that appetite was the master hosted that demon that regulated your life but the appetite is dead you are not trying to use discipline no 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 the appetite is no longer there somebody comes to you and say oh boy go watch match i go buy you three bottles of beer you go flex and then you say beer i don't want to take beer it becomes bitter why the appetite is dead these were things you could do anything for but now the appetite is dead because the word of god has begun to enter it has begun to enter jesus said man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of god that altar the table of shoe bread is where the brother of the word of god makes sense there are many that just come to the place of god and they begin to sleep the thing doesn't make sense to them your life is full of disobedience the altar of Shubre. And when you eat the word of God for a long time, then something happens. You begin to see the menorah. The menorah is the light stand. is the candle stand. You know when you are in the outer court, you can still walk with the philosophies of men. Because in the outer court, the light is the sun. So, you can say, this man of God said this. This one said this. This one said this. So, you are living by the voice of men. When you come into the inner court, there is no sunlight anymore. What lightens the inner court is called the menorah. The word of God becomes the light in your path. Job said, as I was in the days of my youth, when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle, when by light I walked through darkness. That's a man that understands the systems of the menorah. The menorah is made up of seven candles. Three candles by the left, three candles by the right, and one candle in the middle. One stands for the number of God. Six stand for the number of man. Seven stand for the number of completion. The menorah is God dwelling among men to illuminate their lives. That's when God becomes your operating system. You want to marry, it's not about the money. The guy may come with so much money, but somebody has come with Sanda and the Holy Ghost say, This is your husband. This guy may even buy you a Lamborghini, but Lamborghini doesn't count. Now here, this is your husband. God is your operating system. This is where Christianity becomes an organic reality. It's not a set of rules they tell you when you go to church. Don't steal. Don't fornicate. Don't do this. Rules are burdensome. Nobody lives by rules. The children of Israel told God, they say, whatever you say, we will do. And God gave them laws. And for 1,500 years, nobody was able to keep it. Because Christianity is not rule. Christianity is divinity out of work in humanity. And this is how you turn apart. So that God lives to you. The idea is for you to live the culture of heaven on earth. So when we are righteous and sin cannot tame us, it's not because we are disciplined. There is a life walking in us. Jesus said, The prince of this world come to me and find that nothing. Not because he was a disciplined man. Discipline is very important, but it's beyond discipline. The monks in China are more disciplined than you. Some of them meditate for 15 years, for seven hours every day. It's beyond discipline. Is God at work in humanity? The reason Christianity is brought this up to you is because you have not subscribed to the way of priesthood so that it becomes an experience. The people that this thing is an experience, they enjoy it. I'm enjoying serving the Lord, brother. Many times I go to pray and suddenly the wall opens and light comes out and interacts with me. I'm enjoying what I'm doing. The reason I won't leave the place of prayer now is not because I'm even trying to be disciplined. There are things I see there that is beyond it. 
sometimes in the place of prayer or while I'm sleeping my spirit leaves my body and begins to float in my room and I see the things happening sometimes in the place of sleep my body my spirit will come out and an elder will walk out of the wall strange beings and they will come talking with your spirit there are experiences you cannot buy in the market they tell you things and the next day you come out to become a man of wisdom when you speak people wonder where did you learn these things you are interacting with entities from Zion entities John said I was in the spirit on the last day they sentenced this guy from civilization they tried to kill him he wouldn't die so they sent him to the Isle of Patmos they felt he was going to die of loneliness and even in Patmos he said I was in the spirit on the last day I was in the spirit on the last day suddenly he heard a sound as of a mighty trumpet and when he turned he didn't hear the sound anymore he was in heaven do you tell such a man to go and pray no he enjoys it because when he goes to pray he travels in the spirit when he come back he will tell you what is happening in heaven he will bring breaking news he will tell you and <laughs> i saw in the right hand of him that sat upon the throne a book written from within and without hey the guy is telling you stories from heaven he become a newscaster from heaven when he speaks he speaks the mind of god such men you don't beg them to go for prayer meeting they know prayer is a gate into the supernatural the menorah the technology of the menorah it illuminates your soul that's when your weaknesses are swallowed up you come you say this thing can i do this thing the reason your car is able to travel for long in the night is not because the headlamp reaches your destination the headlamp is constantly ahead of you and the more you go the more you see it is the technology of the menorah you reign you ancient zion's king we cry out God of you are mighty You reign, you ancient Zion King. God Many of you are troubling yourself. What will I do in the future? Why waste your time? The future, your future is engraved in this palm. Twenty years from now written on his palm why waste your time finding out something that is secured with God in the place of prayer a being walked out of the wall and he came and he told me he said I am making you an apostle to the nations do you know where I live I live in Makodi there's no airport there but a being showed up he said I am making you an apostle to the nations today I preach one message I caught five minutes out of it and I put it online and I received invitation to preach in four places in America. I never thought, how do I pay for the flight ticket? I will make you an apostle to the nations. An apostle to the nation. It's called the technology of the menorah. The technology of the menorah. I drop a message online and in 11 days, I receive an invitation to 17 nations of the world. It's the technology of the menorah. Why bother about who to marry? Why bother about where to live? It is engraved in the palm of his hand. He said, even the hairs on your head, they are numbered. They are not counted. They are numbered. He knows your tomorrow. He said, it is not given to man that walketh to order his death. How do you tell the things that will happen tomorrow? Whether tomorrow you will die. Are you aware? You are praying for an interview when there is an accident scheduled for you. It is not given to man that walketh to order his death. That's why you need the systems of the menorah. The Holy Ghost will come and in the place of prayer, He say, we know not what to pray as we ought to. But the spirit, it helped our infirmities. It's got the technology of the menorah. You are praying for an interview when you should be praying for your life. Because tomorrow, there are rapists that are looking out for you. Tomorrow, there are armed robbers coming to your house. You know not what to pray for as you ought. Even if you know what to pray for, they say you don't know as much as you ought to pray it. Even if you know as much as you ought to pray, they say you don't know how to pray it. It's got the systems of the menorah. The lightning powers of God, the illuminating dimensions of the Holy Spirit. That's what gives life to your days. A system of the menorah, the ways of the spirit that illuminates the soul of a man. You become so illuminated and you become like a colossus. You walk among men, but your head is in Zion. Jesus said, The Son of Man, which is in heaven. 
the man was walking on earth but by the illuminating powers of the holy ghost while he was on earth he was still in heaven he was by locating by the systems of the menorah you will see it and tell your father don't go out tomorrow because you saw in the spirit that he had an accident it's called the systems of the menorah my sister was in a relationship with a young man a vagabond he was famed in clubs they gave him awards at the end of the year because he was throwing money around and I was serving in worry in 2013 and my eyes opened and I saw her husband and I called her the body I said your husband doesn't have full hair his face is broad and he doesn't use eyeglasses that man you are with is not your husband this lady was 32 years old there was pleasure but I saw from heaven and she broke out from the relationship crying and weeping while she was still crying a young pharmacist showed up and he said who is this lady tell me about this lady and they gave her gave him her phone number and in three months she was married to a pharmacist a god-fearing man in the winner's family why it's called the systems of the menorah 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 my sister who is a widow but her son suddenly began to have itches all over his body and she was afraid running to the hospital and the Holy Ghost told her see your brother and she brought the boy who had not been able to eat for two days who was dying and the moment she brought the boy while they were entering the Holy Ghost told me when they come okay it's called the system of the menorah I hugged the boy and I said I invoke the powers of my ordination live and not die and immediately my eyes opened and I saw a fraternity of darkness that wants to implicate her and call her a witch and I judged them by the spirit I said let the fires of heaven come upon them and burn them and in three months their fraternity was scattered it's called the system of the menorah the boy was saved the woman had her liberty because there was a man who could see through the veil of the spirit when we talk priesthood we talk life if priesthood is not part of your life you have not started living I see many young ladies pathetic they are selling points is their beauty what a shame pathetic a woman that at 35 loses all her beauty the moment she becomes pregnant her beauty is gone something so shallow so time bound is your selling point it's a shame at 35 your stomach is protruding your eyes your face begins to sag at 35 you are not even a man that lives for 50 years and is still handsome a woman her selling point is her beauty is a waste women are supposed to be the first intercessors that's why everywhere I go I anoint the borders the womb of a woman is a gate into the spirit realm only the woman has the ability to bear dimensions from heaven and a woman with that type of complex and intelligent design makes her selling point her beauty do you know what is in your womb do you know the possibilities you can bet just by kneeling down for five days you don't know who the woman is. The woman is the preserver of the world. The woman is like an incubator. Anything God wants to preserve is the woman that preserves it. Did you not notice that when Jesus died, it was the women that went to the grave to anoint him, to preserve his body. When Jesus resurrected, it was the woman he saw first. When Jesus asked God the gospel to be preached, it was the woman he told first. You don't know who the woman is. You think your selling point is your beauty. What is she? We cry out, God of mighty You ancient Zion's king. We cry out, God of You right. Hey, oh my God. I need to complete this message. I'm beginning to see the spirit realm. Hush! Hush! Holy Spirit, help me. Help me to instruct your mind. Wait, 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 wait. I need to instruct you a bit more. You see, the spirit realm is beginning to open. I can see light. I can see light enveloping this place now. If I stir myself up now, the whole hall will scatter. But you need to hear this. When you leave the menorah, then you go to the altar of incense. That's when intercession becomes your life. Priesthood is prayer. A man who cannot pray, he cannot move the hand of God. 
priesthood is prayer the way of the altar when the earth was destroyed there was no hope anymore there was no hope every man was plunging into darkness and then suddenly somebody stumbled on an intelligent and the bible said from the days of Enosh men began to call upon the name of the Lord that's the first attempt of redemption from the days of Enosh men began to call on the name of the Lord and when the new earth was created something happened the Bible said Noah raised an altar Noah raised an altar when God started the journey of salvation with Abraham what happened the Bible said no Abraham raised an altar unto the Lord that appeared unto him the way of the altar is the way of priesthood prayer is the only hope for a generation a system that does not have prayer factored into it is a system plunging into darkness when prayer becomes the economy of your life something happens then the holy of holies is open as the incense enter the holy of holies then the high priest enters the high priest enters with the incense the first thing that we enter the presence before you show up is the incense it is your prayer that enter to the courts of god before you can make an appearance only men of prayer can appear before the god of zion that is why you cannot give to god apart from prayer you cannot relate with god apart from prayer you cannot talk to god apart from prayer you cannot give a gift to god apart from prayer the only way to relate with the water spirit that dwells in the midst of the coals of fire is by prayer the only way to approach him that is inapproachable dwelling in the midst of light is by prayer men of prayer are men of the presence when you come into the presence then something happens the dimensions of your ordination begins to open that's why the prophet in you begin to cry out that's when the beat in you begins to cry out that's when the authority of the kingdom is conferred on you when the high priest enter the holy of holies then he can intercede for israel he can tell the god of zion show mercy show mercy show mercy because legislation and litigation begins from the holy of holies and only men of prayer can travel that far in god yes you can read scriptures you can meditate on scriptures but if you are not a man of prayer the presence is not your habitation if you want to make the presence of god your perpetual habitation then you must become a man of prayer that's why you can judge iniquity that's why you can fight the systems of this world there's a system called egypt egypt puts you in the world perpetually and in egypt there are pharaohs pharaohs fight your life they kill your firstborn they kill your gifts they make a slave of your destiny even the gifts of god upon your life pharaohs shut it down it's the system of egypt it keeps you in the world perpetually but in the presence there is something in the ark it's called the rod of moses you can stretch it and you will divide the red sea you can stretch it and you will judge it there is something that is poured upon the ark it's called the blood the blood of witness with the blood you can escape from the world when you travel and you are walking with god there is a city called jericho it is jericho that will stop you from getting married because in jericho no one goes in no one comes out but it blocks your way from your pilgrimage in jericho something happened the trumpet of the priest comes alive that's when prophecy begins to walk and by prophecy jericho will sink by prophecy jericho will sink there's a place called babylon babylon has the cause it can come to take you from the house of god and take you back into the world but in babylon there's a technology called fasting and prayer it's a technology that activates archangels it's a technology that activates priests to judge the leviathan to judge the gods of this world all of that technology is factor in the intelligence of priesthood Pray. This is the time to pray. This is the time. 
is here to anoint. It's an impartation night. That's why the power of God has been hitting people. Tell the Lord, my vessel is ready. I'm ready for you tonight, Lord. Use me. Go ahead and make that your prayer. Tell the Lord to use you. 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 be sensitive now. From my left hand side to my right hand side from the front to the back Holy Spirit pour your oil Shabbos. Help them. Help them. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. You read. You read. You read. God, come upon me. Celebrate the Pareto, Pareto, Ripa, Satatana, open up the Paito. Warriors, Warriors, Warriors.
prophets are inquired of the Lord. He took is raising prophets, prophets that will bring back righteousness to this campus. A revival of prophets. And so, dear spirit of the living God, after the count of three, let the Lord descend. Holy Ghost one, Holy Ghost two, Holy Ghost three. God's Celebra Dios 
to make an altar call for those of you that are making up your mind that from today your life will become a mobile altar you are saying to the Lord if you need a man on earth to pray I will pray come up quickly come forward we are badly in need of intercessors men who can devote their time to prayer to prayer and the ministry of the world There is a fire that is about to begin to descend. Father, in the name of Jesus, set them on fire now. Let the fire begin to rest on them. Help the sister. It's a fresh fire. It's a fresh fire. It's a fresh fire. Holy Ghost, touch them. Empowerment. 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 Touch. Touch, touch, set them on fire. Set them on fire. Set them on fire. Set them on fire. Hey, you are implicated, sister. Set them on fire. Set them on fire. Set them on fire. Intercessors, prophets rise among your rank. Apostles, evangelists, rise, rise, rise. Arise, shine. Arise, shine. Arise, shine. For well, the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Let your light shine now. Fire of God. Touch them, touch them. Let there be burnings, burnings, burnings. Somebody's leg is about to begin to burn. Somebody's leg is about to be set on fire. That one is a missionary. That one is a missionary. Traveling to the nations of the world. Burn. Burn, burn. Somebody's hand, somebody's hand is about to catch flames. That one is a healing evangelist. A healing evangelist. Your hand is about to be set on fire. Burn, 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 burn. Ushers, help them. Help them, help them. Burn, burn, burn. I'm seeing somebody's eyes burning in the spirit. There is a flame of fire on your eyes. And in the natural, the sensation begins because you are a prophet. And in the prophetic ranks, you are a seer. Let the fire burn. Burn. Burn for Jesus. Burn for Jesus. Burn for Jesus. Zegabash. The chains of darkness over your soul is hereby broken. I come with the rod of a higher priesthood. 
and I declare the bondage and the captivity. Roll away. Roll away. Roll away. Roll away. Let the gates of the realm open to you. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. I'm seeing somebody that has the ministry of signs and wonders. This man walks with the angelic. This man walks with the angelic. Help him, help him, help him. A ministry of signs and wonders. Angelic, angelic. He walks with the angelic. Help him, help him. Jesus, Jesus. Marakabash, Rapates, Rededesh, Kobriska. I'm seeing somebody. Sometimes around last week, you had three dreams consecutively, and you saw yourself ministering in the power of the Holy Ghost. Ministering in the power of the Holy Ghost. Where is that one? Just wave. You don't need to come. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Let there be activation now. Activation. 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 Touch. You are the covenant keeping God. You are the covenant keeping God. Yahweh. The covenant keeping God. You are Yahweh. Yahweh, the covenant keeping God. Yahweh, you are the covenant keeping God. Everybody, just lift your hands toward heaven. There's about to be a fresh baptism of fire. A fresh baptism of fire. A baptism of fire. Radicals for Jesus. Radicals for Jesus. About to rise. Radicals. I hope you enjoyed this video. And I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also if you are watching this video and you don't know Jesus Christ, ask the Lord and personal Savior. I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.